So let me first of all thank all of you to come to this session here at the OECD. We're actually very excited in the post-COVID world to see people here in person and to share ideas. That's really the point of these, of these sessions. So really thank you so much for making the international trip to, uh, to be with us here today. The title of the session is Priorities for Global Financial Governance in the Digital Age. Uh, this is very timely, and the purpose of this session is really to bring together literally all of you. We know your backgrounds and you are the right people in the room. It's to bring together a range of public and private sector audiences who have expertise from the technical and operational side to governance to interoperability to public policy. So when we talk about governance in this session, we really mean it at the highest level as a chapeau to bring together all of the work that you do and all of the challenges that you face and, and frankly, to try, and, to try and engage in an honest dialogue about how we can make progress toward goals that I think that we all share. Um, but before getting into the philosophy of it, um, importantly, when I say we have senior experts here who are going to help shape that discussion, um, I really mean it. Um, so let me introduce them. Um, Leonardo Gambacorta, Head of Innovation um, and Digital Economy, Bank of International Settl Settlements. Um, who I've had the pleasure of working with um, when, when I was at the BIS. Leonardo was previously the research advisor and head of monetary policy at the BIS. So when he talks about innovation and about technology, he really understands it as well from the monetary policy side. Um, Adeline um, Bachelary, head of digital currency and innovation, Banque de France, and she has written numerous publications and issues across CBDCs and crypto assets. Uh, Paolo Ar Ar Ardonio, Chief Technology Officer for Tether, uh, and also prior to that, the Senior Software Developer. Scott Vagas, who's the Vice President, Global Re Regulatory Policy for Coinbase. And Scott was previously Acting Director of the Economic Analysis Division at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, and also um, in that role represented the SEC on the Financial Stability Board for, for some years. And then Masaki Besho, who is the Head of the FinTech Se Center of the Bank of Japan, and previously was the Associate Director General of the Bank of Japan's Payment and Settlement Systems, who really knows these issues from the payment standpoint. And Simon Chantry, the co-founder, CIO, and Chief Operating Officer of, um, of Bit Inc. And also he's a member of the OECD's Blockchain Experts Policy Advisory Board. And Simon and I have been on a number of panels sharing some of these ideas, and I really appreciate the fact that Simon um, actually has been involved in launching CBDCs, and not many people can say that. So I really, um, and then lastly, I would say Tom Nealon, head of risk, uh, head of risk, Tom, there you are, head of risk and policy here in Paris at the Financial Action Task Force. So previously a policy advisor at the UK Treasury. Um, and I would also like to thank, I'm not sure if they're here, but I would like to thank Oliver Garrett Jones um, and Nina Skubzak, my colleagues who have provided intellectual contributions and organization of this session literally wouldn't happen without their, their, their effort. Uh, and then lastly, with that, I'm Rob Padalano, so I'm head of a financial markets division in the broadest sense, even digital markets. So we cover global financial markets, sustainable finance, digital markets, and also I oversee the staff working on the Blockchain Policy Center that have brought us this forum here today. Uh, and our Committee on Financial Markets uh, is a committee of central bankers, finance ministries, regulators, and also um, international organizations. And it has given us the legitimacy to have these discussions among public sector participants um, in, in, in closed door sessions. And part of the reason why we're having this forum is to get perspectives from all of you here on the panel and you in the, 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 in the round table to, um, to have us um, also bring back your opinions to this committee so they can really think about some practical issues and how to overcome challenges in a way that's practical and, and reasonable and balanced. So then let me just say too, that part of the reason why we're here is to discuss the fact that digitalization and technological innovation is poised to bring about transformation in, in finance and money in the broadest sense. And that we're, we're trying to have a discussion that is based on market-driven innovations and also public policy initiatives across the ecosystem for crypto assets, trading platforms, decentralized finance, and then of course in the case of CBDC. And of course, it goes without saying that we're here also to try and better understand the risks. And over the past few months, we clearly have seen some risks in the markets and in crypto asset markets, there's been a loss of over 1 trillion. And, and, and that raises questions of policymakers and politicians and many in society about balancing potential value 
versus risk, particularly to retail investors that, that, that have lost value in this market. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, we've seen a sharp rise of central bank discussions, uh, many discussions, some pilots, and even some launches of CBDC, and um, to try and make sense of how these two interact. So I, I personally, I would say I've seen a lot of discussion about CBDC design and interoperability, and separately, a lot of discussion about stable coins and unbacked crypto assets. And those are both really important discussions. And that's great if you're looking in the short term about how to address risks or how to create innovation. But we're all here in part to be thinking maybe five to 10 years out about what do we want the system to look like? If we want to have a resilient financial system that is a digital financial system and a cash-based or traditional financial system with the right policies, central bank policies, financial regulation, that can create innovative dynamic markets and systems that can support sustainable growth while protecting retail investors and citizens with respect to privacy, et cetera, that's really what we, we, we're trying to achieve. And with this discussion, it's sort of a first step for us to bring back to our committee and other committees um, that are relevant to try and bring back your thoughts. So for me, it's a very exciting discussion. I hope you feel the same way. And I wanna thank the panelists for actually taking the time to be here in Paris. So turning to, um, to the ground rules or the guideposts, first, Leonardo is going to set the scene in a global perspective on these developments and we'll give him about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I will give each panelist a few minutes uh, for introductory remarks and we've really given them free reign to say what's on their mind so it should be wide ranging. And then we'll try and bring it back to these themes with a few questions about, about the markets but then also about the international financial architecture and how we can get this right over the medium term. And then hopefully time permitting, we'll have a Q&A so you can really ask the experts anything that's on your mind. And then finally, we'll give them a parting shot to give, um, to give final words to their counterparts. So if you're in public policy, you'd have some final advice for private sector and private sector to public policy. And then we'll wrap it up from there. So with that, uh, thank you again. And I will turn it over to Leonardo for presentation. So thanks a lot for uh, the nice introduction and uh, for inviting me to this, uh, to this panel. So I prepare a few slides. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to in a way, uh, introduce the discussion by framing uh, what uh, we can uh, uh, see as uh, uh, money and payments uh, for, uh, for the future. Uh, I base my discussion on uh, a number of papers. I hope that uh, this is uh, working. Uh, we go to slide two. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this presentation is based on a number of papers that have been developed at the BIS. Uh, the main bulk of the analysis, if uh, you don't uh, want to spend a lot of time reading all these papers, you can go straight to uh, chapter three of the BIS annual report of uh, 2022. Of course, uh, uh, the usual uh, disclaimer applies. So this presentation uh, represents uh, my personal views and uh, does not necessarily the view of, uh, of the BIS. So uh, let me start describing you the, uh, the outline of the presentation. So as a, as a first point, uh, I want to analyze if uh, the actual uh, crypto world is uh, really improving uh, the, the monetary system. Uh, there are uh, certainly a lot of uh, innovative uh, uh, elements in crypto and uh, uh, that we have to consider. But I would like to argue that uh, there are also some uh, uh, structural flaws that prevent uh, the crypto universe uh, from serving as a sound basis uh, uh, for the monetary system. And uh, these flaws uh, go uh, beyond the risk highlighted in the, in the recent uh, uh, crash. And the second part of, uh, of the presentation wants to lay out uh, a vision for the future monetary system that uh, should adapt to serve society. And uh, uh, the future monetary system should be based on a two-tier system, so a public-private uh, uh, partnership, but should be at the same time uh, grounded on uh, uh, central bank money uh, and let uh, the innovative private sector payment service to grow in a vibrant, uh, in a vibrant, vibrant ecosystem. Uh, for, for this, I will introduce a, a metaphor that has been used in, uh, in chapter three uh, of the BIS Annual Economic Report this year, the, the, the one of, uh, that one of, uh, of a tree uh, whose track is the central bank 
and the branches uh, are the vibrant activities and the innovation developed by, uh, by the private sector. And uh, we'll see that uh, H3 represents uh, a sort of a domestic ecosystem and the different ecosystem form a sort of a forest at the international uh, level. So uh, the actual monetary system, uh, I would say, is a, that is when we consider the monetary system, we have to consider money and payment system, is, uh, uh, is stable in uh, at least uh, most countries. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but of course, there is a lot of uh, room for improvements. So I would like to argue that these uh, new technologies are essential for such improvement, but in a way they have to be uh, guided. And uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, notable area of improvement in the last few years is in uh, cryptocurrencies. As you know, crypto wants to cut out the, the middleman and uh, introduce a sort of a decentralized uh, monetary system. See, this is the idea of uh, decentralized finance or DeFi, or of uh, decentralized internet or web 3.0. But uh, we'll see uh, also in this presentation that uh, uh, decentralized finance is, uh, is in a way an illusion because uh, uh, it needs uh, to import uh, credibility and stability from, from the outside. So let me analyze the promises and pitfalls of, of, the, crypto, uh, of the crypto sector. So this graph shows you uh, the market size of uh, cryptocurrencies and, and DeFi. Uh, crypto, of course, has its origin uh, in Bitcoin, that is uh, the red area in this, uh, in this graph. Since the advent of, of Bitcoin in 2009, many other blockchains and associated crypto coins have entered into the scene. Some of these crypto coins are defined stable coins. that could be asset-based or uh, algorithmic-based. Stable coins and DeFi coins are used as a nominal anchor Uh, into the DeFi world, so that the DeFi world is a, in a way uh, sort of a self-referential. Uh, you can see that the market has expanded rapidly up to the end of 2021 and then started to, to collapse. And uh, it reached the peak of uh, 3 trillion in uh, November 2021 and now is uh, below 1 uh, trillion. And some of the coins are, drowned, are, are now down by, uh, uh, by uh, around 90% since their peaks. So, uh, so what are the problems of crypto? So let me start first uh, uh, discussing the crypto's uh, uh, building blocks. So cryptocurrencies rely on a decentralized networks of validators uh, who record transactions on a distributed ledger. Uh, DLT variants like blockchains are called permissionless because validators need no special permission to take part. Any, anyone can serve as a validator. And, uh, uh, and these are also uh, pseudo-anonymous because uh, everyone can see the full history, the full transaction history, and, uh, but uh, identities are, uh, are hidden uh, behind uh, an address. Uh, and then there is another element that are the rewards and fees that are needed to prevent uh, validators from, from, from cheating. Uh, so this is the first part. Second part is decentralized finance or DeFi. Uh, refers to a range of activities across financial services uh, built on uh, permissionless DLT, DeFi uh, develop uh, services in, uh, in all uh, fields, uh, lending, uh, wealth management, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, other, other, other aspects. Uh, but uh, uh, DeFi uh, tries to replicate existing financial services um, without financial intermediaries, and uh, uh, supported by stable coin, uh, which uh, want to maintain a stable value relative, relative to uh, uh, sovereign currencies or, or other assets because uh, uh, of uh, uh, the volatility that is in intrinsic in, in many cryptocurrencies. So uh, the DeFi world introduced uh, a lot of very good things, uh, such as new function that uh, I will claim that they should be considered in, in the new world, such as uh, programmability, composability, and uh, tokenization. And these are elements that are very positive and should be introduced in the, what uh, we can see as uh, the, the future uh, uh, monetary system. So, uh, but there are, as I, I mentioned, some structural flows in crypto. The first one is uh, congestion. So, and relates to the incentives uh, to uh, decentralized validators. So, to ensure that uh, these anonymous uh, validators uh, don't cheat, 
and manipulate the ledger, they need to be incentivized through rewards and fees. And to ensure uh, incentives are adequate, blockchain need to feature a sort of a transaction limit, which results in congestion and the generation of transaction fees for the users. So in these slides, you can see this problem for the Ethereum blockchain. As the number of transactions increases the, 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 on the x-axis, the fees also increase exponentially on the y-axis. And, uh, uh, but let me put this in, uh, in, in, in other terms. So congestion is essential here because uh, uh, it's a way to incentivize the validators. So the question is, uh, why blockchains do not scale up? One way to respond to this question is to see what is the cost of using one of these blockchain platform, and in particular, if we look at the gas fees. So uh, for those of you that uh, they are not familiar with this term, the gas fee is uh, the compensation for validators to perform their task and to report truthfully. The compensation increases exponentially with the increase in transaction in the platform. And when this increases too much, the blockchain cannot scale up. And a new blockchain uh, has to be created. So now the problem is that uh, these, uh, uh, these blockchain have to be interoperable, but this introduces new risks. Uh, we need uh, what is called cross-chain bridges that could uh, be subject to, of course, hack and uh, weakness in governance. So uh, another... Uh, Another uh, aspect of this is that uh, all this results in, in increasing uh, fragmentation of uh, crypto. So when a blockchain gets congested and its transaction fee fees uh, go up, uh, users uh, move to other blockchains that are still cheaper. And uh, this is exactly what we observe in this slide. When Ethereum congested in mid-2021, other blockchains enter into the scene. This results in a fragmentation of the crypto sector with many competing blockchain and coins. And this means that crypto does not benefit from uh, network effects. And uh, in addition of this, as I said, uh, uh, there is this problem of uh, crypto bridges that uh, could uh, add, add uh, some additional uh, security uh, risks. So let me pass to the second structural flow that is caused by the pivotal role of stable coins. So stable coins are used to uh, overcome the extreme volatility of cryptocurrencies as uh, Bitcoin. For, for example. So in this way, uh, DeFi imports uh, credibility from the central bank money. So there is, a, 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 of course, a, a disconnect here because uh, on one side, the centralized finance want uh, to uh, eliminate the middleman and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, to be uh, uh, decentralized, but in a way, uh, it has to in, in, uh, import elements from the, from the real world. But we know that stable coins are not stable at all. They are uh, baked with uh, uh, assets that sometimes uh, uh, we, don't, we don't know. They, they could be risky. So there is also an uh, element here to be uh, considered in terms of uh, uh, understanding uh, the value of the asset that are in, in, this, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the stable coin uh, as, uh, as collateral, as a baked asset. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we, we experience the, 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 the implosion of the Terra USD plus uh, uh, stable coin in May, and uh, this is just uh, 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 something to, to consider that uh, uh, stable coins could be also subject to runs. And also, when uh, uh, the Terra USD uh, broke the back, a classic run occurred, and this is even spilled over to the largest uh, stable coins in the, in the, in the market. So, uh, so in this second part of the presentation, I would like to describe uh, a new vision for the future monetary system that combines the very, very good function from uh, the DeFi world with uh, safety, stability, and accountability of uh, central bank money. So uh, what is this vision? So first of all, central bank remain at the core of the system, providing a foundation for services by the private sector. The system is thus uh, built around uh, core of trust provided by the central bank, the money, with uh, uniformity, uh, uniformity and convertibility of, of monies, and the creation of a positive network externalities, because in this case we don't have the problem of congestion. And the new technologies are component of the, of the future monetary system, and then I will uh, like to discuss uh, three elements. The World Seed, Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDCs, and tokenization. 
the retail CBDCs and the fast payment system, and the multi-CBDC arrangements. So the foundation of the future monetary system starts from the central bank money, the TSM0, that provides the core of the monetary system. It is like a, a tree trunk that in turn supports branches and leaves and indeed a rich of, uh, and diverse uh, ecosystem uh, of uh, private sector uh, services. And uh, the private sector payment service provider or uh, PSP are up to the branches. Uh, these include both uh, commercial banks and uh, more importantly, uh, non-banks uh, who should be competing with uh, one another to provide uh, a service to, uh, to users. And uh, the, 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 payment, uh, the payment service providers uh, have access to the new uh, wholesale CBDCs, uh, which are an advanced representation of central bank money. So here we could discuss if uh, wholesale CBDC is new or not. In, in my impression is uh, we have already wholesale CBDC since uh, many years because already uh, uh, the, the banks, they enter into the central bank uh, balance sheet by means of uh, you know, the reserves. But on top of the, uh, the, 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 the wholesale CBDC, what is important is uh, uh, the, uh, the creation of new functionalities that could, in a way, enhance uh, the, the concept of wholesale CBDC. Uh, and the wholesale CBDC can, uh, therefore, enable programmability. Um, that means making uh, payments conditional on pre-specified pre uh, uh, criteria. Um, say that I want to, to buy security, but I want the payment to go through at the same time as I transfer the security. Uh, so those uh, can be done as uh, one transaction that is called atomic uh, settlement. It's called atomic because uh, uh, the components are, uh, in a way, inseparable. Uh, then uh, wholesale CBDC can also enable composability, which is the capacity to combine uh, different financial services in, uh, in, an at in one atomic transaction. And uh, this is also referred uh, many times as uh, the money le Legos. And uh, finally, there is a possibility of tokenization or the digital representation of private monies uh, uh, and assets. This can allow, for example, for uh, tokenized deposits, uh, for instance, which are uh, uh, bank money, so it's uh, M1, and potentially non-banking money on a permissioned uh, DLT platform. Tokenized deposit could uh, enable uh, programmability for retail, retail uses. For instance, uh, uh, I don't know uh, you, but for example, when you buy, uh, when I bought uh, the, the house, uh, I had to uh, uh, transfer the, 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 the check and, and, uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the, the notary was, uh, was uh, uh, taking note of uh, the, the, the transfer of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the asset. This was not in, in combination, but uh, uh, it is possible by means of programmability to buy a, an house and transfer it uh, at the same time when uh, the title of the, ta of the, the house is, uh, is transferred. So it's uh, something that also really uh, touch our uh, real uh, life. So in the, in the background, uh, We'll say CBDC can help to settle that conditional transfer as a part of this uh, atomic uh, settlement uh, transaction. So let me move now to the retail level, where uh, I think uh, there are uh, uh, the most important uh, progresses. So retail CBDC hold great potential to enhance financial inclusion and uh, lower the cost of payment. Retail CBDC are like digital cash, a form of uh, M0 that is available uh, to households and businesses. And uh, uh, CBDC are uh, quite similar to uh, retail fast payment system, many of which are operated by central banks and allow users to make instant payments. So the decision uh, to have a CBDC is uh, really at the jurisdiction uh, level. So with the, um, with the um, application of a layer of fast payment system can allow to, uh, to the new uh, functionalities that are, uh, that are uh, obtained through a CBDC. So, uh, between a CBDC and uh, new forms of fast, pay fast payment system, there is a continuum of, of, of possibilities. So in, therefore, in, in both cases, uh, the application of uh, APIs uh, empower interoperability so that different institutions uh, are all integrated into the same system. <coughs> so the key difference here is that while uh, 
with the CBDC we create M0, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, fast payment system uh, are made uh, and are used uh, via uh, M1, another component of money. So it's still uh, early days for retail CBDC, <laughs> but the experience uh, with the retail uh, fast payment system and int interfaces already gives uh, a lot of insight uh, with the, with the in, in this regard, and uh, we can see, for example, uh, the experience, the recent experience of PIX in, in, in Brazil. So, so far we discussed uh, uh, domestic solution. So let me move to the international level. So here there are great initiatives that link together CBDCs uh, or fast payment systems. So like the, the, cano the canopy of a tree uh, where branches meet, this initiative can support uh, greater cross-border integration. And uh, what is important is to link uh, wholesale CBDC through multi-CBDC platform. So these are defined as solutions to make CBDC system compatible or to create a shared system for cross-border, cross-currency CBDC payment. And uh, these types of capability can support a very broad range of uh, innovative payment service uh, domestically and across borders. The BS Innovation Hub uh, has been working with central banks on several concrete uh, uh, prototypes on uh, multi-central bank digital currency platform. Let me conclude very briefly. So the monetary system uh, is a, a crucial foundation for the economy. So society rightly uh, puts up high demand on the system and these are at the core of central bank mandates. Crypto is evolving fast and has introduced a new function that could be very useful. But as currently designed, the crypto has some flaws and cannot serve as the basis for the monetary system. So in the future monetary system, central bank money can enable programmability, composability, and tokenization to foster a vibrant monetary ecosystem. This uh, will be uh, achieved via advanced uh, payment rails, such as uh, wholesale and retail CBDCs and uh, retail fast payment system. And all in all, uh, a public-private uh, partnership on, uh, uh, on those lines uh, could help, uh, and uh, the monetary system should be further adapted, supporting uh, the public interest and sustainable in innovation. And uh, I stop you and I'll pass the, the button to, to Bob. Excellent. Thank you so much, Leonardo. That, that, that was a wonderful presentation to set the scene. I think that also raises a lot of questions in areas of, of, of mutual challenge. Um, I want to do two things. First, um, uh, 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 because of the issues that you raised, I think it's only fair that if anyone would like to ask uh, questions, I would just take a few, but I think it would be good just to have some questions to respond to this excellent presentation. I might have one myself. The second thing I would like to do, a little bit of housekeeping. There are empty seats here, and this is really meant for, for you all, so I would love for those of you who, unless it affects your ability to see this, if you would like to come and sit at the empty seat so we can have really an engaging discussion, do not be shy. There's, uh, do those seats say that they're like reserved in any way? No, no. They're reserved for, well, those, they're, the people aren't here, so if you would like to sit in those seats, seriously, please don't hesitate to come up to the front. Okay, <coughs> questions, any questions, comments, reactions, pushback, please. And if you want to state your name and organization as well, that's great. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Antonia Islander, and I'm a corporate and tax lawyer that specializes in crypto assets. And um, what's fascinating for me is CBDC, uh, because my business partner is into crypto from the very beginning, and we constantly have really <laughs> nice debates about CBDC because I see the good in it and he sees the bad in it. So can you please, if you have opinion, tell us, um, do you see really something bad that can happen, like really the state and things like that? Thank you. Excellent question. Your last, your last sentence about the potential for state control, I think, is an important one. And happy if Leonardo wants to be specific, more specific about what that means. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. 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 Thank you. So, um, how agnostic will 
CBDC become towards what we think of what is right and wrong um, with regard to certain certain transactions, trading with enemies or and so on, or countries, uh, resilience and equity capitalization of financial institutions. So with CBDC, you might be able to control banks with regards to this topic. Um, and when you look to, uh, at central banks, at this point of time, they do use all their instruments uh, to control inflation with regards to timing, publications, interest. And to what extent do you all expect that central banks will use the progr programmability of CBDC uh, to solve our crisis, like uh, by, for instance, prevent that householding store up too much CBDCs. Thank you. Nicely put. Um, any other any other questions? One one more question. Yes, please. Thank you, um, and, and uh, thank you to uh, Leonardo for the presentation. Um, uh, my name's Sean Jones. I'm a former financial regulator um, of crypto firms, amongst others. Um, we heard from you uh, how you see um, crypto in its broadest, <laughs> it's a term, an all-encompassing term, how you see the technical developments within crypto being harnessed uh, within a central bank money system, which is the current financial, uh, global financial system. You talked about um, DeFi and some of the high level characteristics, but I'd be interested to know if um, the absence of reference in the solutions uh, reflect uh, a notion that DeFi will be kept outside the system, or whether you see uh, opportunities to bridge what will become, likely to become a more deeply entrenched uh, system outside the system, which is one characterization, I think, of, of, De of DeFi. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I will abuse the privilege and, and given, given our mutual heritage to say that my understanding is that um, money, in Roman times, money was held in temples. So the central banking and religion were, were, were interrelated, and this concept of the perfection of money, and in God we trust in the US dollar, um, has, has been around for thousands of years. And the programmability of CBDCs is the first time that you're blending something other than a very, very basic function of the paper of money. And when you add programmability, you're adding something that traditionally, at least the banking system had, or payment system had provided, right? So if, if this doesn't, if this doesn't work, the central bank just can't say, "Well, I'm supervising; I'll supervise better." They take, they potentially take part of the blame. What does that do for the risk to the trust in central banking and in money? So with that, we leave well, the question. Thank you for uh, this uh, uh, excellent uh, question. I will try to be brief and uh, to respond to all of them. I think that um, I will start with uh, the issue about uh, privacy. And uh, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, cryptocurrencies are not uh, great for privacy. Um, if you know who is behind a certain address, uh, you can see all uh, uh, his transactions. So let's start to say that uh, uh, this, that is not a solution. So I think that CBDC could do a much better job as they could be built to respect privacy, plus to serve uh, legitimate user. So no, no one needs uh, to uh, understand uh, and know uh, where I buy my groceries. And, uh, uh, and I think that this also protects the central bank, which may not want uh, to access to the identity information or to the full ledger uh, or s retail transaction. And there are, uh, 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 from a technical point of view, intermediate uh, solution in which uh, a fast payment system, sorry, uh, the payment system provider, as in fast payment system, they, they basically provide uh, the KYC. Uh, and this is, for example, uh, how it is done uh, in, uh, in particular in the Bahamas for the CBDC, and uh, 
in this intermediate architecture where the central <coughs> bank only has uh, the wholesale transaction um, history and this could be a solution. It is as a, imagine uh, it is as a, uh, if uh, uh, as a owner of all information, uh, all the pieces of the of, of a jigsaw puzzle, but uh, uh, where only myself I know all these pieces of the puzzle, but uh, uh, the other, they, they don't have uh, the full picture. And uh, there are technical solutions for, uh, for, uh, for doing this. And uh, um, so, of course, then uh, there, there could be some exceptions uh, no? as, uh, uh, to this principle, as uh, we have uh, today for the bank secrecy laws. And, uh, um, but we need to, to build really uh, guardrails to ensure protection of privacy. Uh, we need to arrange uh, access to the data only where this is strictly needed for law enforcement. And uh, again, to make just sample with uh, the case of the sun dollar in the Bahamas, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, a court order is needed to get access to the information from the central bank and uh, the agency uh, then need to combine this information they receive under a court order from the private sector payment system provider. So, short question, uh, there are technical uh, solution uh, for uh, uh, safeguarding uh, privacy. Um, on, on the programmability, I think that you answered already. So, <laughs> I will just touch uh, based on uh, what is uh, the, the future of DeFi? So if uh, you know, I'm so negative on DeFi and... Uh, so I am an uh, economic uh, researcher by training. I I'm start very hard to understand uh, what are uh, the economic benefits, for example, in DeFi lending. So, and um, I, uh, I think, uh, why should I have uh, a loan that is over collateralized? So if I have... Uh, uh, I need a loan of 100, why well, should put as a collateral 200? So it seems to me this uh, world of DeFi as a, for example, just to make you the example of lending. Uh, in lending, there is a problem of asymmetric information, so between the bank and the client. And we, we are, there are able to solve, there are some ways to solve this asymmetric information. One is collateral, no? to, re to reduce the asymmetric information. And in other case, you know, I need information, soft information from the, the client, so it seems to me that in DeFi, we have uh, uh, intermediation without information. So I don't know if this is uh, uh, good or bad, but for me it's very strange. In any case, uh, I see in DeFi a lot of potential uh, good things in terms of technology to be used. So what is important is uh, that uh, from the regulatory side and from the private sector side, there is a lot of exchange because uh, I, I don't think that in the, in the, in the future we'll, we live in, in a world without DeFi. It will be different. It will be different with uh, uh, maybe a better solution in terms of the stable coin. Who will uh, issue the stable coin in the future? The banks probably, I don't know. Uh, forms of tokenized deposit entering into the... So the DeFi is a, for me is a, could not be simple decentralized finance full stop. It, it has to be uh, a, a, a world in which uh, you have uh, proper links uh, with the real world uh, and these proper links uh, uh, should be uh, actually regulated. Excellent, thank you Leonardo. So I think it, that's already getting to our theme that there are a number of activities with potential benefits but we're already starting to see some of the risks arise and getting our heads around how to address that from a policy perspective to extract benefits and, and, and understand and manage the risks um, is, is, is what we're here to talk about. So excellent. Very good start. So without further ado, look, we have a range of views here. I think we should just dive right into it. And I'm sure you're all ready to give your own perspective. I, I was trying to think in my head about trying to do public and private sector, but I would rather just simplify it. Paolo, I'd like to start with you. We're just going to go straight around the table, except for myself and Leonardo. And then, and, and with Tom, if you all can agree with that and mix up public and private, if you all are amenable to that approach, yes? Okay, great, please. Hello everyone, I'm Paolo Arduino. I'm a CTO at Tether. 
Tether is uh, the biggest stablecoin in the market so far, has around 68 billion uh, in market capitalization. Um, today, well, of course, there are many, many topics that uh, can be discussed here. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to give my perspective in, on the industry. One of the things that also, uh, given the, the current um, presentation that, that just finished, I think that there is a really, we need to categorize cryptocurrencies. That is one of the first things that we need to do, right? So not all the cryptocurrencies, all the cryptocurrency projects and DeFi projects are the same, right? They, so for example, everything started from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency that uh, actually introduced blockchain to everyone, is the um, most liquid cryptocurrency and has been adopted and used all around the world for, for many good things. We are, so although of course here we are in Europe, we have to think about that there are um, jurisdictions, there are places, emerging markets, developing countries that have enormous amount of people that have, that struggle to have access to bank accounts, right? So not because there are bad people, but the cost of banking is enormous, right? So the cost of um, banking infrastructure in these countries is so high that prevents many, many people, we are talking about billions of people, who have access to financial services, basic financial services. So uh, you can see how um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency has been a global um, establishment, right? So it's not like uh, jurisdictional. So these are distributed ledger technologies. So they are global, right? So you have, we talk about validators, the validators can run everywhere. So it can be operated anywhere in the world. So you can describe cryptocurrencies as being global. So we have to think about that. Something that uh, you know, maybe we discuss here could affect also people and other uh, parts of the world that are in desperate need of cryptocurrencies as a, as a lifeline. Um, also uh, talking about um, stable coins, that is the other um, sector where we need categorization. Um, of course, there are um, the majority, or I would say ev almost every single, the majority of these assets are held by privately issued stable coins. Um, and they can be divided into uh, asset backed or algorithm stable coins. So we have seen how, what can happen with the poorly designed algorithm stable coins. And in fact, um, you know, even in the stable coin industry, we have been extremely creative to, to certain type of approaches because of course, Customer protection is extremely important. Um, but uh, on the other side, we have seen, we are seeing every single day how stable coins, I'm talking about Tether, for example, this is my example. We are seeing how Tether is being, first of all, extremely helpful to, in Turkey, in Venezuela, in, um, in, in, in Vietnam, in, uh, in Argentina, in, uh, in Brazil. So all these, um, Developing countries are, and in, in Africa as well, right? All these de developing countries are in desperate need of a more stable currency that they can use, right? And they, they could look at Bitcoin, they could look at all the other cryptocurrencies, but they look at stable coins. So when you live in a, in a, in a country where, for example, Turkey, where your national currency devaluates 80% in a year, you want to look at something safer, right? So you are living there, you might want to have your children going to study abroad. And the only way to do that is saving in a part of the money in something that is not uh, your home currency. Otherwise, at the end of the year, you will be poorer than at the beginning of the year. So that's where we are actually are seeing the major use case of, of stable coins as Tether is, is the leading there, right? So we are actually, uh, the, the role of Tether and I think stable coins, at least privately issued stable coins, shouldn't be trying to replace banking. Um, we, I think that both Europe and US and, and uh, have the best banking system in the world, right? So they have good banking rails. The majority of the people can access to bank ser banking services and all the basic financial services, loans and everything. But is there are really billions of people that don't have that luck. And that's why what we are doing is, is, is so important in my opinion. So um, also with, uh, with Tether, we have proven that uh, uh, we can improve on the, um, we can provide given uh, the uh, programmability, given the, the fact that um, as, uh, um, uh, as was mentioned before, blockchains are not that private, right? So you can use tools like chain analysis 
um, that offer a risk-based approach to monitor on-chain transactions, catalog them, keep track on them, and so on, you can actually have a lot of information, a lot of history on transactions. So in the case, on in our specific case, because I know that really well, we have been uh, cooperating with law enforcement all around the world. Actually, the speed on which we can react is much higher than the traditional banking system. Before entering uh, in, in the cryptocurrency world, I've been working um, in, in the traditional banking system and financial system. And so the thing that uh, I like most about what we are doing is the technology innovation, right? So money is already digital. So talking about CBDCs and talking about um, um, you know the integration of blockchain technologies and DLTs te technologies, is extremely important because we'll bring, an, in my opinion, a, a sort of an outdated financial technological infrastructure towards like a, make a jump of 30, 20, 30 years into the future. And so that is an extremely positive aspect. But privately issued stable coins like Tether can have um, a team, they have a team of people responding immediately to law enforcement requests. When we have been working with the Department of Justice, you, the Europol and many other uh, organizations to help and combat crime. So um, as of now, we have um, we have we are collaborating with 60 ongoing investigation without counting the ones that we already have successfully closed and helped. We we are, we were able to return uh, one more than 100 million dollars as part of um, um, so frozen and returned to either the legitimate owners or to um, the regulators overseeing um, these law enforcement agencies. Uh, we were able to return, as I said, more than $100 million. Another $100 million, were able, we were able to return to the legitimate, legitimate owners that were subject to hacks. So we have an entire framework that is designed to respond to customer and law enforcement needs. And the time, the average time frame for that response is 15 minutes, right? So that is quite higher than what we, at least I was used in with the technology that was available to the traditional financial sector. So there are, there are many uh, exciting points here. And I think that um, thinking how we can um, leverage this technology to uh, combat um, you know, uh, terrorism financing, to combat uh, child exploitation. I mean, I'm lucky to, to be in a company that have two um, chief compliance officers, one for, for Tether and the other one for Bitfinex, that really take these issues um, at their heart. And they are actually uh, spokespersons for, for, this, for combating this type of crime. So we are always on the forefront of the innovation with our companies, but also we are on the forefront of, of making sure that, as always, technology can be used as for good things and bad things, but also we we want to fight for, for the good part of, of uh, the innovation, of course. Um, that's me. Very good, excellent. You raised a number of um, very important issues. And I think at the end, Tom, if you could also sort of keep that in mind, the issue about law enforcement and, and, and how digital finance can be very effective in that way, that would be very useful. Great, so then I will turn it over to Simon. Thanks, Rob. Uh, hi, hello, everyone. My name is Simon Chantry. I'm co-founder of BIT. Uh, we have some of the most advanced CBDC deployments uh, across five unique digital uh, currency deployments across 12 countries currently. Um, so our job is basically to take what applies from crypto, the, the evolution of financial technology in crypto, and apply it to our digital currency management system, uh, as well as sort of the ambitious uh, research that's been done by the Bank for International Settlements, that the recent paper, Future Monetary System, basically describes CBDCs as acting as uh, the core of the future monetary system. And so we have the challenge of sort of keeping up with all of the ecosystem developments um, happening in crypto and DeFi, and as well as uh, paying attention to what central banks and monetary authorities require worldwide to upgrade the technology behind their, uh, their national currency. Um, there's a few different ways that I could take this. I think we, as you can imagine, dealing with central banks from around the world, we collect requirements and, and implement uh, them in our solution. Uh, I should say that if, if we think about Bitcoin and one of the core value propositions of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is different than crypto, um, the, one of the core value propositions is the policy and the functionality of the system is transparent. You can audit it. 
uh, you can verify it. And this is what's basically, it's a fundamental part of the value proposition uh, that's given rise to the market saying it's, it's valuable to the tune of you know, trillions at, at its peak, but the, the growth is clear. Uh, and, it, and it makes me think in the future that CBDC systems are going to be scrutinized in a similar manner um, and that the privacy concerns, the security concerns, data handling, data residency, uh, these will all be heavily scrutinized um, for any monetary system that's going to be able to service uh, substantial volumes, which again, if uh, our colleagues at the, at the BIS and certainly central banks worldwide have um, lofty ambitions for where these CBDC networks will, will grow to. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of different ways to take this. I think um, the, the first one is uh, that, that we're facing sort of a challenge with right now is the line between how much is a service provider like BIT responsible for in a CBDC deployment versus the central bank themselves. Um, this is new for central banks. Yes, they've operated RTGS systems in the past in collaboration with the private sector, uh, and yet there are, there are new boundaries because this is an augmentation of their responsibility. It's an augmentation of what they've had to operate in the past. And so uh, that's one of the challenges that we're working through right now. Definitely uh, interesting to see the Treasury and Fed moving more heavily this year. So we're grateful and, and participating, you know, MIT DCI and Project Hamilton to answer some of these questions and to, and to come up with, um, you know, propositions that, that should make sense in the long run. But still a lot to be defined, still a lot to be uh, agreed on and, uh, and standards to be set. Um, the... Uh, I guess next, the, uh, one of the big ones is identity and, and the amount that identity plays into these systems. Um, KYC collection and verification, as it's been done traditionally, is uh, leaky and, and definitely not secure. So this is something, uh, when we speak with central banks, it's sort of, it's married. Uh, how much data is flowing through? What are the data, data residency considerations? And uh, what's, you know, what's going to minimize the transaction and storage of, of personal information in the future? Uh, because it is a huge risk. And I think in crypto, we always we hear alarm bells. Oh, CBDCs could be used for oppression. And of course, if they're architected poorly and they get in the hands of the wrong sort of regime, yes, they could be used uh, in an oppressive manner. So the challenge now is to design systems that can resist against those sorts of futures. Um, and this is where sort of, in my view, all roads seem to lead to a verifiable credential solution for identity. And so this is where we're looking to, you know, incorporate that into, uh, into deployments wherever we can. Problem is coordinating all the different bodies who are responsible for these things is a challenge because identity provision uh, varies, of course, region to region, but um, often it's done by transportation authorities or, uh, anyway, as you can imagine. So uh, these are some of the challenges. Um, I could say the, the overall theme is pretty clear. The central banks are looking to upgrade their technology uh, to increase their monetary policy tool set to be able to continue to achieve their mandate in, in the face of, sort of private, uh, you know, private developed uh, cryptocurrencies and, and stable coins. Um, and you know, again, I, I think they also see the ability to more precisely target monetary policy. Um, right now they rely on you know, months old data to make decisions uh, and, and there's a proposition that you, know, you could get real time inflation and, and disease, you could get a number of other sort of real time uh, economic data to help inform monetary policy. Um, so this is another element that we're focusing on as we service central banks worldwide. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, like, it's really admirable to see what Tether's done. I think like, it's, uh, it's a clear indication of, of market demand. And um, so I hold the view of CBDCs and stable coins being somewhat compatible and, and that there's a, there's a future for, for both. And it, ultimately it's about servicing payment streams and servicing use cases um, while dealing with an asset class that is completely unique. Decentralization is, is uh, quite a, a concept and, and the fact that you know, Bitcoin has been functioning um, in a decentralized manner and Ethereum of course doing a similar thing. Uh, it's very, very unique, and, and uh, as I mentioned, the fact that the policy and the functionality is transparent, I think, is, is paramount to the value proposition, um, and to see market actors step up and service it, um, is, uh, it it's, I don't know, it's just it's fascinating to take part, as I'm sure everyone in the room can uh, uh, attest to. So anyway, that's an overview of, uh, of sort of bit CBDCs and, and what I'm going to put. Thank you, Simon. And I knew I could count on you to touch on this issue about the programmability of money and getting to this question about, you know, they have to be in the right hands um, and, and handled very carefully. But of course, it does depend on which country is issuing CBDCs because by definition, they could start 
in the wrong hands um, in, in those cases. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, I think we should further explore the issue of programmability and, and whether which aspects should be with the central bank and which aspects, for instance, could be with stable coins that could handle the programmability part in a way that, that preserves central banks' um, purity in terms of, um, of money. Great, thank, thank you guys. And now turning to Beshassan for his perspective, now from a public policy perspective. Yeah, okay, uh, I'm Masaki Besho, uh, head of FinTech Center at the Bank of Japan. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity uh, discussing with uh, various distinguished panelists and uh, participants. And the mandate of our FinTech Center is to be a contact point on FinTech issues for the uh, various stakeholders, including the government authorities and the tech people and financial institutions and many others, both domestically and internationally. And in tandem with this mission, uh, we are heavily engaged with our CBDC works. And today, uh, I would like to briefly explain why we are exploring the CBDC, in particular the CBDC. And the, one of the mandates uh, of the Bank of Japan as the Central Bank of Japan is to pursue further efficiency and safety for the payment and settlement systems as a whole. And the decision whether we will need a CBDC or not uh, should be decided or judged uh, in light of this point. And this means that the CBDC itself is uh, not a goal of, uh, of itself. Our goal is the, uh, ultimately the further efficiency and safety uh, for the payment and settlement systems. And to be honest, uh, related to the point uh, Power pointed out, financial inclusion uh, is an uh, important agenda for many jurisdictions, but uh, is not the case in Japan. And actually, uh, we don't think at this moment we do not have any immediate reason uh, to introduce CBDC, because uh, in Japan, uh, most adults have their bank accounts, and uh, you can find ATMs uh, at anywhere in the country, and almost all the retailers accept cash payments, and uh, cash is very clean, and we do not have any counterfeit. And this means cash is, at this moment, uh, effectively functioning as a means of payment. And also, in terms of the competition landscape in the retail payment businesses, banks and non-banks are fiercely competing with each other, and at this moment, we have a good uh, competitive landscape. Having said that, we are uh, exploring, intensively uh, exploring CBDC. Uh, we are interested in both wholesale and retail CBDC, but uh, recently, our focus is more on retail CBDC. And we are working on uh, retail CBDC, both from technical perspectives and also uh, institutional uh, perspectives. And in terms of CBDC technologies, we started the uh, proof of concept from April uh, of last year. And in the phase one, which was completed in March this year, we verified basic functions of CBDC, including issuance, delivery to users, uh, transfer between users, and acceptance from user to intermediary, and finally, redemption uh, at the central bank. And uh, we published uh, its report uh, in April, and we stepped toward to the phase two uh, of this uh, experiment. And in the phase two, we are now carrying out experiments on some additional functions, including, for example, safeguards uh, to the financial intermediation. And uh, in terms of uh, policy issues, uh, we specified four focus areas. And they are, first, the allocation of roles and responsibilities between the central bank and intermediaries, and secondary, uh, implications uh, for the financial system, and thirdly, privacy and ML shift compliance, and finally, cross-border dimension of CBDC. And why we are doing this exercise is that we should be ready for the future. In other words, uh, whether we will introduce CBDC or not should be a national decision uh, supported by the general public, but we should be ready for the situation where people want CBDC. And uh, actually in Japan, aging and also population drain uh, from the rural area to urban areas, uh, 
we are facing, and in this situation, we are not sure whether we will continue to ensure the situation uh, where uh, cash is abundantly distributed to all across the country. And in addition, uh, it is not sure whether the competitive landscape uh, in the retail payment uh, market will continue because payment businesses have inherent currently uh, have uh, network effects and the business model the te uh, of tech giants who do sometimes rely on leveraging data and which could form monopoly or oligopoly in the market. And uh, in addition to these factors, it's pretty difficult to predict the future and uh, there could be some issues or challenges in the future which we have not imagined now. And uh, given uh, these uh, points, uh, I would like to mention two uh, possible roles of CBDC in Japan. The first is given that the usage of cash declines and cash no longer becomes the effective means of payment, CBDC could be an anchor of value uh, which is compatible at par with diverse forms of payment and that will measure for the values of these uh, diverse monies. And another possible role is uh, CBDC would contribute to the uh, development of payment systems that were more uh, fit for the uh, digital society. And on the point, on some points, uh, as the speakers have uh, already mentioned, on the possible uh, use of CBDC for monetary policy purposes, uh, we are not uh, interested in uh, that aspect. Uh, of course, as uh, CBDC could change the dynamics in the financial market uh, in the future, and we will need some adjustment of monetary policy for the changing uh, market environment. However, uh, the uh, monetary policy uh, use could not be a primary motivation uh, for the CBDC introduction. For example, some academics argue the po potential of uh, tackling the zero lower bound of CBD uh, interest rate, uh, but uh, I don't think it is practical because uh, cash will coexist uh, with CBDC, and in that case, uh, imposement of negative interest rate uh, to CBDC would not be effective. And another point is the sentiment of the society. Uh, it might be pretty difficult to achieve adoption uh, if uh, CBDC imposes negative interest rate. I'll stop here, thank you. Masaki, thank you so much for those comments. And you raised a few points about CBDC versus intermediaries, implications, cross-border nature. Could I, could I ask you exceptionally to, to just give a few more sentences on what the challenges are between CBDC and intermediaries that you're thinking about that in this paper, what, what the issues are, per, perhaps some key challenges that might be faced by intermediaries that you're looking at, if indeed that is what's in, in your policy paper. Yeah, I think there are a couple of challenges. Oh, I'm sorry, if you could just... Yes, yes. I think uh, there are a couple of challenges because uh, there are some concerns that the uh, CBDC could lead to this intermediation in the financial system. Uh, in Japan, the uh, financing of corporations or SMEs are heavily dependent on the uh, bank lending. And in that case, uh, we understand that uh, uh, we should avoid uh, giving shocks uh, to the financial intermediation. Uh, therefore, uh, in the phase two uh, of our proof of concept, we are carefully uh, considering uh, feasibility of some safeguards uh, which could mitigate the impact to the financial system. And that will include, uh, for example, uh, the uh, caps or holdings or transactions or uh, interest rates that are not favorable as the bank deposits. And uh, another point uh, I would like to say is uh, we are thinking of building an ecosystem uh, where the private businesses, either banks or non-banks, can uh, create new businesses on top of the plain vanilla CBDC will provide as a public goods. And I think one of the challenges 
uh, or opportunities uh, the uh, intermediaries, including the banks, would face is how they could create additional values uh, on top of such CBDC. And uh, they should be well aware of user needs, and also they should be adjustable to the future developments. And at this moment, uh, I don't have a clear answer what would be the most promising use cases for CBDC, but we will need dialogues uh, with the stakeholders to specify uh, the use cases. And uh, we really expect courages and uh, innovative mindsets of uh, financial institutions uh, to achieve that goal. And uh, such an ecosystem, I believe, would contribute to the sustainability of the whole ecosystem of uh, retail CBDC. Thank you very much, Masaki. That, that was uh, very much appreciated. And I think thinking about the ecosystem and as well um, your point about reaching out to society, so the decision of whether to have a CBDC or not is a decision that at least is in that society is informed and has some sort of participation in. That's very impressive. Now I'll turn to Adeline, who, who has payments background and can talk more about perhaps the wholesale side of CBDC, if I understand correctly. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm Adeline Bachelery. I'm the head of uh, digital currency and uh, innovation at the Banque de France. And uh, with my team, we are in charge of uh, the um, experimentation program we launched, uh, we have launched. Um, and uh, also as the, the as National Central Bank of the Euro System, we also contribute to the uh, investigation phase of the digital euro. So regarding uh, mm -hmm. the wholesale CBDC in particular, um, I would like first to distinguish uh, maybe uh, two dynamics, two main dynamics. The first one is uh, the growing interest for crypto assets and uh, decentralized finance. Uh, and the second one uh, is the growing interest uh, of financial players in the tokenization of financial assets, which, which are two different uh, uh, dynamics. Um, the second one, the tokenization of uh, financial assets, um, is based on the VATs, of course, uh, uh, as crypto assets, uh, but um, it's a different dynamic for, for, for us. Uh, we are actually uh, witnessing uh, a trend toward uh, the tokenization of financial assets, um, and when we when we launched uh, our uh, program, our uh, experimentation program in 2020, yes, um, uh, lots of financial players uh, came and see us and they explained that they were uh, exploring um, uh, DLTs and uh, um, they wanted to take uh, to take benefits from uh, from new technologies. So our first reaction was, yes, okay, but digitalization is not new in financial markets. Uh, and um, uh, dematerialization and digitalization uh, of assets uh, and the automation of, uh, uh, of uh, financial markets uh, have been ongoing for decades. Uh, but we uh, rapidly uh, understood that uh, it could be a new term based on DLTs. And uh, in particular, uh, the rationale for uh, tokenization um, uh, from the, the, the financial players uh, was of course to benefit from uh, new business opportunities, uh, but also to improve uh, for, for improving uh, the functioning of financial markets. And they um, they, 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 they explain us uh, uh, various uh, uh, reasons such as enhanced transparency, benefit from automatic DVP, the reverse payment, as um, some uh, financial assets do not benefit yet from this uh, uh, atomic DVP. And also, they, they, they mentioned the, the improvement of cross-border uh, transactions. Um, so, they were exploring actually um, the tokenization of assets, and in particular, the, 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 um, the security leg of a DVP. And um, they, they came and see us, as they, they, they missed the cash leg, actually. Mm. Um, so, at this point, uh, the question raised is how transactions uh, involving uh, tokenized financial instruments uh, should be settled to take full advantage of the tokenization of assets. Uh, so in other words, uh, actually the tokenization of assets um, raises the question of the symmetric tokenization or not of the settlement uh, leg. Um, so of course, uh, several solutions 
on the table, um, commercial bank money, tokenized commercial bank money, maybe. Um, of course, table coins, we have already spoken about it. Um, and uh, central bank money. Um, and um, central bank money, which is the, 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 the safest and the most liquid uh, asset, um, we wanted to, 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 to be able to provide uh, our assets uh, to be able to settle uh, those tokenized uh, assets. Um, of course, uh, with DLTs, uh, we do not have yet uh, the huge traffic volume and so the, the associated high level of risk as we have for um, financial markets. Uh, but um, we think it's necessary to anticipate and um, to secure financial transactions uh, as it's also uh, a recommendation from the last financial crisis to, to settle uh, financial securities uh, in uh, central bank money uh, following the PFMI, the principle for market infrastructures. Um, and that's why we, we, we have launched this uh, experimentation program on wholesale CBDC. Um, in our experiments, we, we, we worked on the tokenization of uh, central bank money uh, as uh, Leonardo mentioned, um, central bank money is uh, already um, uh, it's already digitalized uh, with our uh, payment systems on the, so with our RTGS. Uh, but the idea here was to 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 um, to work on the tokenization of of central bank money and how we could uh, keep control of our central bank money. Uh, on decentralized uh, ledger, which is not um, so easy for central bankers. We, as used to, to, we are used to work with centralized systems. Um, and of course, we will, we, we, now we will we continue our experimentation uh, program, and, uh, but we are not dogmatic. We know that we, we, we have uh, various solutions on the table, even to, to offer and to provide central bank money for, for the settlement of tokenization. Thank you, Adeline. So, so you had mentioned, I think that I was just saying, oh, well, you know who I am. So she she laid out she laid out different different options, even for wholesale, let alone retail, but just for wholesale laying out different options that go from pure central banking to getting into to, to tokenized commercial banking money. And um, I, I'm presuming that there are pros and cons of each and just wonder where you, or how you thought through. I mean, you're running these pilots, but maybe give us a flavor yes, of where you Yes, to, to be transparent, we, yeah, yeah. We, we are not in favor of using stable coins to, to, <laughs> to, to settle uh, okay. um, tokenized assets, financial assets. Okay. Uh, the objective is to to be able to, um, uh, to, to provide certain amount of money even in the area of, tokeniz of the tokenization of financial assets. Okay. And that will be the seed of one of our debates of the panel, so how about that? Very good, and Leonardo and I, we, we'll, we'll pass and go over to Scott about Coinbase and, and, and your perspective. And we've been focused on certain issues, but I know that you also have, have interest in other issues about, I don't know, same, same risk, same policy, so feel free to be expansive in, in how you approach. Great. Uh, Rob, thanks for inviting me to participate in this panel. I am going to shift gears a little bit. I'm historically been a market regulator. Uh, as Rob introduced, uh, I was at the SEC for more than a decade, and I left to become an academic and uh, work out my days as a professor. And then something happened last February where uh, Coinbase convinced me to come and help think through their policy issues. I've actually been working with them since the uh, May of 2021 on what I think is one of the most seemingly intractable policy issues today, and that is going from electronic markets to digitally native markets. I didn't fully appreciate the difference until I started working on these issues. I thought we were already there. And then I realized, oh my gosh, we're still in a paper-based system. We still have a mobilized certificates buried 100 miles underneath the ground to prevent a loss during a nuclear holocaust. And all of our systems are still 100 years old in terms of the process about how we do them. So it takes a major rework, in my view, to solve these problems. Uh, I've spent 20 years in TradFi. I'm a year and a half in. I still feel like 
I'm only not even halfway there. And so then I look at my, all my colleagues that are still in government who don't have the luxury of spending full time on this and just appreciating how hard it is for them to catch up with what industry is already trying to implement and use. And so that's the basis uh, for how I think about these issues. Um, the fundamental thing that has taken place, I think it's obvious to everybody, is peer-to-peer -peer transactions without use of an intermediary. This has just fundamentally shifted the way financial tra transactions can be done, and it requires a significant policy rethink. It's a massive disruption to incumbent financial inst uh, uh, institutions and banks. They're rethinking about their existential risk of what am I going to do 10 years from now. And it's also true for regulators who have a symbiotic relationship with those that they regulate, myself included, uh, as a former uh, regulator. And I think the most serious threat to effective global governance right now is simply the education gap. Right? Regulators don't understand all the nuances. They're getting there. That needs to be overcome. The fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, we call that the FUD from industry, uh, is, is huge. And the rule of thumb is often, let's just ban. And frankly, amongst many incumbents, that's also the view. Uh, don't change. I don't like changes. Keep things the way they are. Uh, one of the criticisms I often get going and talking to a regulator, they say, show me the use case. Gaming, NFTs, okay, come on. What really uh, are you going to do for society? Uh, remittances, yes, but what else? What comes after that? And I thought about this a lot, and I think we are still laying the, building the infrastructure, the plumbing of the system right now, securing layer ones, figuring out bridging, custody, digital identity. A lot of progress is being made. But you're not going to, and these are, all, these are going to be uh, additional payment rails that are embedded into Web3, right? This is the token-gated commerce that people are talking about. But you're not going to see wide-scale uh, wide adoption until there are regulatory frameworks in place. Amazon's not going to accept Bitcoin as a means of payment unless there's regulatory certainty on how to treat that particular transaction. And so I think that is... The focus that I have at Coinbase, every consultation that I see, I say, should we respond to this in some way? Just yesterday, we submitted a second response to the BCBS consultation on the treatment of crypto assets. We think Basel is far too punitive, far too conservative. One of the best things that can happen to digital assets, if banks are more involved in the development, bringing their risk management to the table, and there needs to be a loosening up, otherwise you end up in the same place that you know, banking was 10 years ago complaining about shadow banks having all the market activity. So you need to bring them into the fold very carefully and very thoughtfully, and I think the BCBS is doing a really good job thinking through these issues that maybe need to relax a little bit more. Um, we also responded to the CPMI IOSCO uh, consultation on stable coins about six or eight months ago, and we read through that consultation. One of the things that was noteworthy to me is they talked about stable coin arrangements without really talking about what a stable coin arrangement is, right? And so we wrote a white paper and issued about two months ago describing our view of stable coins. And Leonardo were talking about, and I were talking about this at the break or the, in the green room right before this. I look at what the BIS uh, is doing right now and educating the market and saying to our Coinbase Institute, do the exact same thing. Help explain these issues. Uh, in a nonpartisan way uh, to help people understand what so we did with uh, that consultation. Same thing, we responded to the Fed discussion paper uh, on CBDCs. We don't have a dog in the fight here. Uh, we're very pro-innovation. We understand monetary policy risk, systemic risk, economic power risk. They're really big questions to answer here, but we do think that it's going to come everywhere one day, so let's think about it thoughtfully. Uh, and in fact, because we think a uh, global regulatory framework is necessary. We actually petitioned our regulator, primary regulator, the SEC in July for rulemaking. And this goes back, Rob, to the thing that you mentioned. We think this idea of same risk, same regulation, it's really outdated, it's misguided. The principles, yes, haven't changed in 200 years. Conflicts of interest, yes, we need to mitigate them. But new tech needs new rules and something, something I hope we can explore a little bit more if we have time, exactly what that means. Thanks so much, Scott. And I think that's the issue. It's very easy to say same, same risk, same regulation. But given the, given the, 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 well, I could say complexity, but it could just be the education gap. Even for regulators to understand what the risk is can be very challenging in different forms. And therefore, the regulation either could be tailored or could be clarified. And there are certain jurisdictions, the way that they're going about the enforcement, 
could create more confusion in the market, which adds to real loss for individuals, for taxpayers, for retail investors, which is the opposite result of what we all hope to achieve. I could have said it better myself. Well, so we're going to ask you, we'll, we'll, we'll ask, uh, I'm glad we, we agree on that, so I will ask you to expand on that in the next session when we get more into regulation. And there are probably some regulators in the audience too, so if you want to weigh in um, on, on that as well, then I, I would welcome that. Um, now we'll turn, lastly, to Tom, who brings a FATF perspective to this, and I think, if anything, you probably has the, the, the least education gap because you've been chin deep in this, in, this, in this debate for a few years now, so Tom, over to you. Thanks, and yeah, I was going to continue Scott's change of gear. Uh, you can tell I'm public sector because I'm wearing a tie, but we're from the other end of the public sector, uh, which is we've already developed standards and we're in the business of applying them, so what we're grappling with at the moment are the practical challenges of building a supervisory system for a sector that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and it's not easy. Nobody's done this for over a century. Um, we've got central banks now, but this is the sort of creation of the central bank story that you're seeing. So the FATF's involvement in this, for those who don't know us, we are the standard setter for global rules against money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, and it covers a wide scope all the way from law enforcement to financial supervision um, and also supervision of the professions. So this slots naturally in. We have a laser focus on one issue across all of these different sectors. We started looking at this in 2014 after Silk Road was shut down for massive criminality. Um, and that was when really the global community, public authorities all became conscious that this was a problem that they needed to get on top of. Uh, we were seeing risks of terrorist financing. We're seeing risks of proliferation financing. North Korea is very busy in this space and nobody wants that to go uncontrolled. So in 2014, we started looking at the risks. In 2019, we agreed binding global standards for how countries should regulate this sector, which is for a regulatory body ridiculously fast, but compared to the problem far too slow. And since then, we've been working on implementation. Um, and I was going to list through six challenges that we have found in implementation, both in designing the rules, because it comes back to Scott's point that the same risks, same rules approach doesn't really work. Um, in order to mitigate the risks to the same extent, you have to do slightly different things. And this is an opportunity to do some of those things better. Um, so the six challenges. The first one is practical. Regulating a new sector requires people to pass laws. Members of parliament have got to pass legislation. Parliaments are, if anything, even more congested than the ether blockchain. So it takes a long time for them to find the time to do this. So things move slowly when MPs are involved. The second um, is what you said, Scott, uh, FUD. Technical demands on supervisors and law enforcement are enormous. Uh, financial supervisors are not mostly digital natives. They didn't have the tools that they need to understand what's going on on blockchains and on other digital assets. They don't have the staff who understand these things. They don't have the data streams that they need in order to supervise. So there's a long process of supervisors building their capacity to understand and regulate these issues meaningfully. Um, there's a third one, which is that the anti-money laundering rules, like all of the traditional supervisory rules, rely on intermediaries. We go to banks and we say, you have to supervise your customers. We go to lawyers and we say, you have to know who your customers are. If you go to a DeFi protocol, there is nobody who you can regulate. There isn't an entity that's controlling this and acting as a gatekeeper. And we've struggled enormously with the conceptual challenge of who do you tell what to do? Um, and we're still struggling with that. Although it's an advantage that a lot of DeFi protocols aren't quite as decentralized as they present themselves in the marketing material. Um, that's an advantage. It's a feature, not a bug. Um, the fourth challenge is privacy. Um, like Leonardo said, Pseudo-anonymity is different from the sort of privacy that you have in traditional financial services. Here, everybody knows what you've done, but nobody knows who you are. And it's exactly the opposite. So we've got to adapt our rules so as to preserve people's privacy. And that means applying things like the travel rule, um, the rule that information about who's originating and who's receiving a payment has to accompany that payment all the way along the payment chain 
it means we have to implement that same fundamental principle in a completely different way because otherwise we would expose everybody's identity and all of their financial activity for the world to see and that would be entirely unacceptable and, and actually disproportionate. Um, a fifth challenge is culture. When we started looking at this issue, we had uh, the crypto sector that started out as libertarian um, and freeing transactions and people from the dead hand of governments and central banks. Um, that's not a best foundation for building a public-private partnership between exchanges and regulators and law enforcement. But actually, I was really pleased to hear Paolo talk about what you're doing with law enforcement. What we've seen over the eight years we've been working in this space has been a real transformation of that culture and, and the development of exactly that sort of cooperative partnership that we need in order to secure um, all of these forms of new payment methods. Um, and then the last challenge is an international one. Um, traditionally, we apply more controls to cross-border transactions than we do to domestic ones. Um, and in this world, you can't tell what's going across borders and what isn't. So we're having to find a new paradigm for applying cross-border controls, in effect, to everything, but without overburdening small domestic transactions. So all of those have been conundrums. Most of them we're making progress with, but as you'll see, if you look at the, the periodic updates we do on implementation, we're still a long way from having all of the world securing this space. Um, and until we do, we've still got lawless spaces in which crypto activity is entirely unregulated, and that's a vulnerability that we're very conscious of um, and need to fix quite soon. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. So you've touched on a number of issues. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on one of the issues that you addressed, which is the DeFi space isn't as decentralized as we may have thought even just a few months ago. So DeFi may be a challenge for regulation, but the fact that there may be concentrated players or nodes, whether you think about activities or you think about governance and equity, in some way, the fact that we now know that de decentralized finance is less decentralized than we thought, does that give you comfort that there, 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 there's an emerging image of people you can go to to, to engage and regulate? Or, or, or as, as Paolo had mentioned, that there are players in the market who are actually much more willing now than maybe they were you know, five or eight years ago to engage with the policymakers. Thanks, you're absolutely right. I mean, it gives us more comfort right now that there are people who can be regulated, there are people who are able to control the governance, for example. Uh, the holder of a governance token um, is able to influence the design or change the specifications of a DeFi protocol. That's actually an advantage. It means there is someone a regulator can talk to about problems. But that situation isn't going to continue forever. Um, and DeFi protocols are going to become more and more genuinely decentralized. And that's a problem where we've got a little bit more time than we expected to deal with that problem, but we still have to deal with it quite soon. And there was something, I mean, a lot of us, I think, were at the Louvre conference earlier this week, and Augustine Carstens from the BIS was talking about, well, a different paradigm. We've been regulating entities so far, but central banks can also regulate activities. And we've got maybe months or maybe years to develop an understanding of what do central banks, what do AML CFT supervisors need to do to regulate the activities or the protocols so that if there isn't a person who's accountable, then they are secure by design. Excellent. So that wraps up our first session, which was really much more about um, the knowledge of activities and structures and, and risks, and we're going to move now to consider policy. Um, but I think we actually got into, we had a nice segue into the policy realm, which naturally arises from thinking about activities and risks. So what I'd like to do, it's, it's, it's 3.30 now. I would like to move a little bit more quickly through policy so we can have an active Q&A where really you can benefit from having your questions answered. Um, what I'd like to do is ask each of you, having heard also what other people on the panel, I, I know we all come with, with, with our own points, but having heard what other people on the panel have said, if you could just give really two minutes each about the key policy challenges, policy steps, where you want to see this go um, in terms of um, regulation and international financial architecture, 
by regulation, we started talking about it. We haven't really talked about international financial architecture, but I guess what I'm saying is Bretton Woods had certain players that were looking at traditional financial systems. And do you think that in the current environment that we need to really think differently conceptually about the structure of policy oversight of this area, perhaps in areas where the education gap is too big, that we need to bring in other players or other ways of thinking to do this in a way that addresses risks but supports innovation for sustainable growth, which is the point of this. With that, Paolo, I will stay in the same order. I turn it over to you. So I think that the, it, it's quite important that uh, uh, definitely we are going to see sort of uh, agreement across regulators all over the world uh, on on policies uh, related to cryptocurrencies. So first of all, touching base on DeFi, I think that uh, definitely one of the key issues that we have now that should be addressed is that uh, now everyone can wake up and create a token, right? And that token can be sold, right? So there is a, a huge speculation aspect that of course requires uh, specific attention. And there is the governance part that is the exciting part of the technology. Right? So um, I think that what we are seeing, the reason why uh, DeFi is more centralized than what the name um, means is that uh, we are seeing uh, projects actually maintaining the majority of the tokens for themselves because these tokens are proven to be extremely valuable and hence that kind of goes against the concept of decentralization because there is, sorry for the term greed, in the way uh, this is handled. But um, this, uh, I think that the DeFi aspect is, could be, um, we could learn uh, from the decentralized finance using the technology and we are seeing also, um, we were talking about lending pools, but we are seeing also uh, permission lend lending pools with uh, KYC, AML aspects linked to the access of these pools. So is an entire level of legitimization or like uh, anyway, ensuring that certain um, laws can be applied also to DeFi. For example, uh, you can have uh, third party attestations for accessing these DeFi pools so that, for example, the KYC AML can be still being operated by a trusted approved party that can vet for the quality of the participant, but at the same time, the participant on chain remains, uh, the privacy of the participant remain respected on a blockchain. So um, I think that regulating this part is going to be quite interesting because there is, from the operational part, there is, of course, we, we aim to see um, regulations that uh, look forward to the growth of a new technology, right? So it's not all the time that happens that we are um, seeing the potential of a such disrupting technology that can, first of all, bring down the cost of uh, maintaining the banking and financial in infrastructure, right? So uh, again, I've seen in my, my working life how the, the um, let's say, the dating of the financial infrastructure is actually really can be seen in the cost of maintenance it, that is reflected to the people, right? So the beauty of DeFi is that is streamlining, is bringing new, new technology in all this new, in this sector. So is actually, I think that the banking sector should look into, um, into the DeFi protocols in order to take the good parts and, and try to leverage that, that technology to um, reduce the cost, the friction, even for them, even in the banking uh, industry, there are a lot of intermediaries that might not be necessary and they're adding up to the cost. So the streamlining of, of, this pro of these processes is extremely exciting, but of course that has to happen with the you know, right rules. The problem is always what we are going to do with since this is a global industry, right? So. If you regulate in Europe, what happens in the US? What, are, what if there are two competing regulations and that, like companies will struggle to, to understand how to properly make these two, let's say, continents interact with each other on a blockchain that is actually shared because blockchains are global shared state systems, right? 
So that, that's the challenge that, that we're seeing. But um, I think that what we are seeing uh, globally is like a more and more understanding education on these topics. Um, there is uh, um, definitely a lot of bad, as has been, uh, has been said. There is, uh, um, there are definitely publicly, we need to um, make people understand why uh, what has been built till today is a game changer for, for, for their life. Again, I, I mean, I want to go back to the financial inclusion aspect because it's, it's really dear to us. It's something that, as I said, the, the work on that, that uh, is happening here in the US and in Japan will affect what um, the, the way um, blockchains will be used in, in Africa and uh, in, in South America and, and in, in, in Asia, and there is a desperate need of, of this technology. So I'm, I'm really, we, we are just um, excited to be at the table and, and be part of the conversations and, and give us, uh, and give you our feedback um, as, because we think is um, is a unique opportunity. Right, Th thank you, Paolo. Uh, Simon, uh, two minutes for you, please. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so I guess I'll start by just saying Blockchain is such a broad category, so it's it's difficult. I mean, there's so many different applications. So that's where I, I think this forum has a challenge, blockchain policy forum. There's so many different things that we could hone in on. As far as crypto goes, um, Paolo had mentioned before the classification of crypto. And I think that's one of the, the challenges that regulators have is working through the now thousands of, of uh, cryptocurrencies that trade on uh, on a variety of exchanges. So diving down into those and understanding you know, the nature of them, what the what the intention is, what the structure and, and distribution of ownership is, because in some cases that dictates the control over the underlying protocol. If you have uh, governance tokens concentrated in the hands of a few entities, then maybe those entities should be more heavily regulated. But anyway, classification uh, of crypto is likely a, a good place to start. Um, I think the, I think education is, is really, really important. Uh, again, yeah, given the fact that it's super easy to create a token, and listed on a decentralized exchange, or even in some cases, uh, you know, other exchanges worldwide that, that aren't so tightly regulated. Um, education is important so that the public knows what they're getting into, and that these things are, you know, not always they, they don't always function as advertised. Uh, for those of you who were around in 2016, uh, 2017 for the ICO run up, I mean, it was it was it was really entertaining. Every possible use case that could be done on a blockchain was advertised and. Uh, you know, billions of dollars raised, but the majority of them um, don't really function the way that uh, uh, that they advertise. So, um, education, so that people know, uh, yeah, just because there's you know some fantastic use case that the, it, it's uh, not only do you run the risk of it being classified as a security and shut down, but you also run the risk of it just being an outright fraud or a rug pull and, and the the creators taking off with with all the money. Um, so I would say, yeah, education is a big component for for crypto. Um, I guess if I flip back to the CBDC side of things, um, there, there are plenty of challenges related to technical standards and, and technical implementation. And I just think more global coordination, what the BIS is doing is great. Uh, I'm not sure how much this specifically pertains to regulation, but again, if I touch on the identity considerations for CBDCs, uh, perhaps it's about formalizing the provision of identity from uh, from, from trusted entities um, that, that, could, that could issue that. And, and, uh, minimizing the the exchange and storage of personal information, I think, is is also super important. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Simon. So Paolo and Simon, neither one of you mentioned um, an, an issue. Um, so I was a regulator 20 years ago, and I would walk to the bank, and we would sit around a wooden table and look at documents and talk with senior management. I am the wrong form to be regulating DeFi. You haven't mentioned the use of technology to sort of um, regulate um, like to implement the regulation. I'm just curious, very briefly though, do you think that that, 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 that is the way of the future where we're sort of, where technology is so dispersed and decentralized that you actually need to go hand in hand with forms of technology to regulate technology? Because we, we you know, humans are not maybe the right, I, I don't know, just like, but a very basic gut, gut reaction from you, is that where you see this going or? I'll, I'll go quick first. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely one of the, I didn't take it this way, Rob, but it's a great point. It's 
one of the things that central banks want in implementing a CBDC is like having 100% compliant systems so they can basically manage all the intermediaries that are connecting into that network, provide them with functionality that corresponds to their, you know, their licensed, uh, their legal you know, abilities, whether it's processing payments of certain amounts or to certain entities and, and providing wallets to you know, enterprise, government, retail, et cetera. Um, I think one of the more interesting use cases we might see is uh, central banks sort of mandate, especially in, in, the, in the countries that have taken a hostile approach to crypto assets, you might see them mandate CBDCs uh, to be the base trade pair for virtual asset service providers. Um, that could be a, a step that, uh, you know, they get closer insight into inflows and outflows and they're able to more closely monitor and, and control. Um, but yeah, and, and then tying sort of wallet tiers and CBDCs to uh, the amount of KYC that's been verified, I think is, is sort of an obvious one that, that's been discussed. And, and uh, yeah, that, I'm sure that'll be implemented. But, um, Paolo, your thoughts? Yeah, so when it comes to CBDCs, for me, is quite interesting to understand the, the level of depth of, uh, of the reach of the CBDC, right? So for example, you could imagine uh, CBDCs being the, um, I've been preaching in, in, in my previous intervention, of uh, <clears throat> using DLTs, the technologies, to revamp, to improve and, and rework the interbank, um, interbank and settlement system and, um, in general, the layer one finance uh, technology infrastructure. Then um, there is still the problem of scalability, so being a technologist, there is still the problem of scalability if you want to reach a, a really deep level of usage of CDCs. For example, if there is an interest of uh, having the, the layer, let's say the layer one or M0 was described of, of the uh, CBDCs into being used by everyone that wants to buy coffee, doing groceries and so on. That will still bring certain scalability issues that will need to be um, either these scalability issues will be given to uh, the private sector or like the public sector still heavily, well, more heavily regulated. So there is the, the issue of um, having access to or having access to all the fresh information from the central bank point of view will be um, is, is the key part that needs to be understood in order to understand what type of uh, uh, enforcement at the bank, central banking level you can apply, right? So otherwise you have to uh, rely on um, the ability of any understanding of the technology that is proving to be complex also at the leaf part of the implementation, right? Because in the um, yes uh, document, uh, document that we have seen, the, uh, the structure was a tree, right? So it's always easy to implement enforcement also at a technological level when you are looking at the trunk, but the more you go towards the leaves, it will be, m be more and more difficult. So um, I think that uh, technology will not solve everything, will still need the ability, will still need people and, and reporting and uh, collaboration between, like real life collaboration, let's say, between, between the parties. So my takeaway is that people will be in the trunk, but we need technology to get to the leaves, to extract the information, to provide it to supervisors, or regulators to better understand it. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, Masaki, over to you. Yeah, okay, uh, given the global nature of finance, or DeFi, or CBDC, or whatever, uh, I'd like to point out the importance of uh, international cooperation. And uh, in this respect, uh, on retail CBDC, I think we have a good progress so far. And uh, actually, in year, at early in year 2020, if I remember correctly, the CBDC coalition uh, was established. The membership of that coalition includes the uh, Federal Reserve, ECB, Bank of England, Bank of Canada, Riksbank, Bank, and uh, Swiss National Bank, and the Bank of Japan, supported by the PIS. And uh, it has uh, a couple of work streams within the uh, coalition, and uh, a lot of uh, sharing of experiences and discussion uh, to form consensus uh, it has progressed uh, at multi layer level. And also, uh, in addition to that work, uh, last year, G7 uh, published the principles of uh, policy principles of retail CBDC, and I think it's a great achievement. It covers certain areas that are critical uh, for retail CBDC, in, and in particular, the uh, principle three, uh, privacy aspects uh, of CBDC, would be a good basis for uh, CBDC design uh, that states 
the importance of user control, uh, purpose limitation, and also uh, data minimization. And uh, also, uh, some works uh, by the BIS and IMF are quite useful, and all of the works uh, contribute to the uh, common understanding of CBDC among central banks and uh, uh, creating some uh, uh, convergence in the approaches of uh, CBDC uh, for, by each jurisdiction. And uh, I think, uh, given uh, the situation, the motivations uh, for CBDC uh, in many in jurisdictions are converging. And that means, in the broader sense, uh, central banks are pursuing the uh, further efficiency and safety in the payment and settlement systems as a whole. And uh, among others, the important role of a uh, central bank is to provide central bank money as anchor for value uh, for various forms of other means of payments. And uh, on top of that, uh, I think there are some areas which would need further works. The first area is technical standards, and another area is further engagement uh, with various stakeholders domestically and internationally. And on the technical standards, uh, I think uh, standards, for example, message formats or protocol or identifier uh, would be helpful uh, to ensure frictionless uh, conver com uh, conversion uh, between different CBDCs. And uh, this kind of standards would also uh, support the uh, establishment of broad ecosystem uh, that will be created on top of CBDC. And another area is uh, engagement with various stakeholders. And uh, last year, in March, the Bank of Japan established the CBDC uh, Liaison and Coordination Committee, where um, he invited the representative from the financial industry and also uh, from the government bodies. But uh, CBDC has uh, uh, policy, uh, policy implications for uh, broad policy areas, so we will need uh, further uh, engagement with various stakeholders, including, for example, on the area of uh, data privacy, uh, MSFT controls, and also, uh, for example, competition, or uh, the uh, fiscal transfers. So uh, we will need to deepen or broaden uh, our engagement at an appropriate timing. And of course, uh, the central bank should not be too forward looking, but we should not be behind the curve. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masaki. Adeline, over to you. Thank you. Um, regarding key challenges, key policy challenges, um, maybe the first one would be um, improving cross border transactions and cross border payments. Uh, in particular, in the wholesale uh, part, um, as uh, it's uh, it's quite easy today to 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 trade uh, securities between um, Asia and Europe, but it's still uh, uh, quite difficult to to settle those securities and to have the real transfer of property. So um, uh, it's still an issue in the wholesale space, also in the retail space, um, and um, during our Implementation program, the first phase. Uh, we worked uh, in particular with the BIS Innovation Hub and um, on various projects uh, um, regarding uh, cross border and cross currency transactions. Um, one of the lessons um, is that um, we, we, we understood rapidly that um, we could uh, optimize the the value chain of the processes regarding uh, cross-border and cross-currency transactions, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, financial uh, intermediaries will disappear. Uh, their, their role may change. Um, we may have new, uh, new entrants, but they will not disappear. And um, it will be a, a, a challenge, uh, an international challenge, to work on this, uh, on this issue. Um, of course, another one uh, is um, regarding uh, coordination between uh, central banks. Uh, we, our TGS uh, are not interoperable. <laughs> and um, if we um, 
if we create, uh, I could say, CBDCs from scratch, uh, it would be um, a major issue. Or uh, we also um, worked um, during our experimentation during our experimentation program on uh, the link. At least we, we started to work uh, on the link between uh, the current legacy systems, centralized systems, and uh, um, what could be DFT systems. Um, so it will be also um, a key uh, policy uh, challenge um, for us. Um, of course, um, I agree with the fact that uh, we need uh, um, international coordination for, for regulation, and this is uh, already uh, undergoing with uh, under the umbrella of uh, financial institutions, uh, in particular the BIS and the FSB. Um, and uh, I, I would like also to, to have a word regarding, uh, you, you have spoken about uh, financial inclusion. Um, so you mentioned here um, your, your retail space, uh, maybe. Um, but the, the, just to mention that the rationale to, for, for central banks to, to, to create or to work on uh, retail CBDC uh, is not the same. Uh, um, in, it's not the same as in, in, in different areas. Um, in Europe, um, so in, in the euro system in particular, um, of course, the, 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 the reflection and the investigation phase on the digital euro um, is based on two objectives. The first one is to uh, preserve the, the, the military sovereignty and to uh, reinforce our uh, strategic autonomy in Europe uh, regarding uh, payment solutions. Um, but financial inclusion is also one of our uh, objectives as uh, even in the euro system, uh, we, we have uh, this issue on the table. And we, the, the design of the digital euro uh, should take this, uh, this issue into, into account. So that's interesting. I've heard privacy, competition, fiscal transfer, and financial inclusion among many topics that don't necessarily fall within the traditional system. So I think that's useful for us to uh, further contemplate that. Leonardo, you do get your two minutes in on, on this topic, so please. So let me uh, continue on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the aspect related to um, uh, the need of coordination. So uh, that is a, something that uh, has been uh, touched by Masaki, by Adeline, um, I think that uh, we have uh, to, uh, to reconsider a little bit uh, um, how the uh, decentralized finance change some uh, kind of uh, paradigm that we have in mind. So um, when uh, uh, I studied the, uh, you know, regulation at the university some, some years ago, unfortunately, <laughs> so uh, I had in mind a trade-off trade-off was uh, between uh, financial stability and efficiency. Mm -hmm. So this was the main trade-off we had in mind. So uh, now what is new? New is that uh, there is a, a crucial role of the data, crucial role of privacy, crucial role of, uh, of uh, consumer protection. And uh, one important uh, trade-off is between uh, uh, efficiency and privacy. So where to position uh, in this, uh, this trade-off? Let's think about uh, uh, two different uh, economies, one uh, advanced economy and one, uh, uh, let's say, less uh, developed uh, market. Uh, the advanced economy maybe will uh, position in terms of uh, uh, wanting to reach a lot of uh, uh, efficiency, but also preserving data privacy because uh, uh, citizens in that country want to uh, limit uh, intrusion in their life. But if we go into maybe another country with the different conditions, uh, citizen could give up their privacy to get better financial services in order mm -hmm. to have, uh, you know, to be inc included into uh, in, 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 the, in the provision of these uh, of these uh, uh, services. So, uh, why I'm telling you this is that uh, at the end, to position in this uh, trade-off, efficiency, uh, privacy, it's a, uh, you know, it's a it's a domestic choice, mm. and these, uh, uh, in in uh, um, in a way. Uh, uh, add to the complexity of coordination because here we have coordination uh, not only at the domestic level that is between uh, uh, supervision authority uh, central bank uh, financial stability 
um, control and uh, data protection authority, but also at the global level to set standards. That is also another layer of, of complexity because of course the digital economy expands across borders and there is the need of international coordination of rule standards. And so this is very important. And uh, in this, uh, uh, um, and also speaking with the, you know, here our colleagues from the private sector, what is a concern of, of, uh, of um, the policy uh, authorities? Uh, the lack of uh, data. So we live in a world in which uh, data is the new oil, in which uh, this is central uh, for uh, the business model of uh, the new players, new financial intermediaries, uh, but we don't, know, we don't know them. So this makes uh, policy makers quite uncomfortable. Thank you, Leonardo, and I would say too that there are probably different trade-offs. You, you mentioned one new trade-off, but I would think that there are now a lot of trade-offs for us to be thinking about and how to create um, policies and also education because all else equal, we can improve those relationships even if there are trade-offs, right? Um, so m more to come on that. Scott, over to you. Yeah, so I, I like what Tom said a lot, so I want to repeat what we have left. I'll just highlight okay. a couple of things. I think we should recognize. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just highlight a couple of things I think we should recognize. One, there's two things that uh, digital assets do to de-risk the system. One is atomistic settlement. We talked about that a little bit. There's a lot of dead capital sitting in the system, a lot of settlement risk that exists today that doesn't have to be there. And that's a major reason the SEC shouldn't be going from T plus two to T plus one day settlement. They should be going like digital assets are today to T plus zero settlement and that can be done. The other thing to remember, we all talk about the Terra Luna uh, uh, disaster and collapse. But remember, we got to watch it all in real time. Unlike AIG, unlike the global financial crisis, everybody got to see, oh, look what's happening here, real time. And we didn't have to rely on anybody for that information, the data, because it was all on chain. That was super powerful. So the two things that we should be mindful of and not lose sight of. And then I'll just uh, list three things that we haven't discussed that I think will come up increasingly. One is disclosures, trying to get users to understand the risks. Uh, there's a long way regulators have to go. Uh, for token disclosures to get uh, to a place that should be reliable. Two, layer one regulation, like how these chains operate. We don't spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, TLDR and that is probably not for a financial regulator to, <laughs> to regulate that, that type of tech. Uh, and the third thing is regulation of DAOs. Some great discussion yesterday on how to treat them as legal entities. Um, there's a lot of thought that needs to be done to figure out how they're gonna play a role in the financial system. Thank you, Scott. Tom, over to you. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be just as quick. I'm going to highlight maybe the problem of dealing with financial innovation. The crypto sector doesn't have a monopoly on innovation. Um, the traditional financial sector is doing a lot of very new stuff at the moment, things like artificial intelligence screening of transactions or real-time dynamic customer risk profiling. All of these are posing big problems for supervisors. They're always very happy when a bank turns on a new system that looks good. They get very nervous when the bank says, can we turn off the old system? Because we're doing this twice at the moment and we've got a more efficient way of doing it. Supervisors need to look inside the black box before they're comfortable doing that. They need to know how can we tell whether the bank is doing this properly? So they need data and they need understanding. They've got to cut through the fear, uncertainty and doubt, but They've also got to actually be there alongside the private sector during the development of these tools. Um, and in the crypto space, you've got blockchain analytics, um, which have got huge potential to do the same thing that we do traditionally in a better and more efficient way. You've got the same thing in the traditional sector and people are developing these tools and then turning up to supervisors and saying, we've got this great new thing, can you let us use it? And the answer is no, give us two years to understand it and then we'll let you. So both sides need to talk more about innovation and use things like regulatory sandboxes to have an understanding that develops at the same time rather than two years later. So that's the biggest thing. I think. Tom, thank you so much. I, I, rec I, I recognize, but yet I'm not going to recognize that it's 40, uh, 401 and ask my colleagues in back, is there another session going on at 4 p.m. that would prevent us? There is not. Okay. What? What I would like to do, well, two things. What I would like to do, I really want to do a Q&A or just if people want to give a one minute comment for what they've heard, just to give us your view, just to allow the audience or around the round table to give some comments. 
But if you have to leave, do not hesitate. If you're trying to catch a train or there's another session or your boss is calling you, it's okay to just get up and walk out. But for those of you who can stay, and for the panelists who can, and not everyone can, just for another 10 minutes, just to hear your views, your reactions, because we would find that really valuable. So questions and reactions. And maybe I'll start around this side. And, 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 and by the way, so Damien is a policy um, uh, advisor at IOSCO, and uh, we, were, we look closely with them. I'd like to give him just the first minute, and then we'll go around for questions and comments. OK. No, 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 thanks, Rob. Um, I'm sort of a, a covert regulator now that I had to tie all this, the, the IOSCO pin to go with my suit, which I'm very jealous of. Um, no, look, a couple of things. I, I must say I wince as well when I hear same risk, same regulation. But I think I equally wince when I hear sort of new tech, new, new, new regulation as well. So, um, I mean, one of the things I think is, you know, as securities market regulators, we are activities-based regulators, but acknowledge the fact that you know, those activities generally involve a, an entity. Uh, and the question often is where can you sort of sink that regulatory hook? Um, and that is very problematic in a system which is sort of trying to remove managerial control from the, from the, from the ecosystem. Um, but that said, I think our work has proved that in DeFi, you have a lot of touch points and entities that you can actually regulate. Uh, the exchanges in particular, I think, um, you know, and they're very integrated. Uh, and none of the risks in that area are particularly new to wholesale financial regulation. Uh, and you see sort of additional risks where they're actually engaging in sort of lending and staking type activities on top of the sort of traditional financial activities. So I think, um, you know, I think what we're doing is sort of taking a slightly more open, sort of keeping an open mind to our own ignorance. Uh, I think it's sort of same risk, same regulatory outcomes at the moment. We're trying to apply our existing regulatory um, architecture to the, those risks. Uh, and sort of keep an open mind to sort of having to adjust or, or issue new guidance to, you know, to, to deal with the idiosyncrasies. I think the European framework um, has got some advantages, and I'm not talking about Mika, in terms of product governance requirements. Um, most of the US uh, and, you know, other, re other regulators have sort of point of sale type uh, requirements. I think moving up the distribution chain and looking at some of the people who sit behind with the ownership interests in some of these very concentrated DAO arrangements. I mean, the fact there is some intermediation is because people want to make somewhere money somewhere along the chain to follow the money, and then you'll get to the risks and find where you can sink your hook. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Damien. Very, very. Yeah. yeah, so just a quick comment and a question. So from technology and the business point of view, model's point of view, that essential building blocks and the next essential point for governance are key management and wallet. You know, that the security and privacy and the identity management mechanism rely on the cryptographic key management for blockchain and the CBDC, potential CBDC. And this is the reason why that we securing your wallet is the most important. And basically, the blockchain technology pushes responsibility on the security and privacy to the wallet. This is the basic uh, model. So we need to have the good design of technology operation and governance of the wallet. EU is now working on the creative standard for the EU data identity wallet. And uh, I think it's a good timing to extend that work to design a good wallet ecosystem for crypt. Now the specification of manufacturing are dominated by the limited number of the big tech company. Uh, Risk Five is currently working on the creating a secure open source enclave. And uh, the two weeks ago, the Open Wallet Foundation was established. Healthy governance is essential for the for the governance of the wallet. I would like to hear that your opinion, if time allowed, that on realizing how, what, how we can create a healthy wallet ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let me. See. Yes, please. Uh, Francisca Salierno, Digital Currency Governance Group. Uh, I wanted to comment what Tom said. So the first challenge, which is parliaments need to vote this, right? Uh, and then I wanted to, the, the, the question is addressed to Bank de France and Bank, de Japan, uh, Bank of Japan, uh, because my one, sometimes I wonder, will this, the CBDC lo be launched because all other states are doing that or just because there's an actual demand from the public? And I say this because, for example, there were, um, reports from House of Lords in the UK or in the European Union, just seeing that the, the public does not want a CBDC. Um, 
part of Westminster, for example, advised against, but still Bank of England is, is going to launch it. And same thing in the European Union with the European Commission. So just my, I wonder what's your, uh, would the launch, the, the, a fast launch be perhaps a counterproductive, um, what do you think if you have a particular view on this? Thank you. Let, let's see other questions or comments. Feel free. Yes, please. Joni Pirovic, uh, Web3 focused law firm based in Australia, but also the founder of, of LawFi DAO. Um, just to pick up on the, the calls from a few of the panel members to characterize the tokens, you know, what are they? And our existing legal and tax rules often require us to look at the entity who is the issuer to characterise the nature of the instrument being issued at the time of issue. And as we can see, tokens, if, if we don't characterise the entity that is the DAO for legal or tax purposes, we lose our way. And tokens being able to be used for a number of things, activities, um, that characterisation can change and, and the, the legal and tax rules are just not coping with that. And so I agree, I, I've been advocating for an activities basis of, of regulation and taxation, but it is a paradigm shift and it's been very difficult. So I was just interested in the panel's views on how we might fill that education gap and um, plug the, the paradigm shift. Excellent point, we really didn't touch there. Thank you for that. Let me see, going around, yes, Nina. <laughs> um, thank you, Rob. Oh, um, yeah, I have a mic on. So I'm Nina. I work at the OECD Blockchain Policy Forum, but I'm also a full-time student at Oxford University. Um, I have two questions, but I'll open with the one that I'm most interested in. So it seems that there is a tension between the fact that this technology is so disruptive, both in positive and challenging ways, and um, between that and the fact that we have traditional regulation and how to match those two. But for the panelists, from your work, what are the areas of this technology that indeed worry you the most and have the most impactful provocations for financial and indeed economic policy that might push it into unorthodox measures and even maybe extend further beyond the mandates of traditional regulation? So essentially, like, what are the most pressing challenges that perhaps traditional regulators might not be able to address that you might see um, forthcoming? Excellent question with an OECD perspective on it, which I appreciate. Thank you. Please. Uh, two questions. So, first question is, um, uh, to what extent will I, as a citizen, have a claim on a central bank and holding a CBDC in my hand, digitally? Uh, because of when you have a banknote, you have a direct claim in full, if you have your money uh, entrusted to, uh, to a bank, then you have a claim on the bank. So what, what's the, the, the legal position of a citizen company with regards to CBDCs? That's one. Secondly, uh, to Tether and uh, Coinbase, um, stable coins have never existed if you look at it statistic statistically. Uh, uh, use the Tether, is more or less 92 cents up to 180 cents. So it, 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 it changes, it fluctuates. Uh, but also if you look at Luna, it has never been a stable coin as well. They claim that they are stable, but they aren't. Because you have claimed that you are stable, people want to see audited uh, reports. You have been sucked into a, 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 a discussion in which you don't want to be. So I would like to uh, see some thoughts, hear some thoughts on this. Thank you. Very good point. And there was a similar discussion that was had around money market funds that were claimed to be extremely stable, and they weren't. And then that prompted regulation. And here we are. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. So uh, my name is Antonia Arlander. And besides being a corporate and tax lawyer, I also give courses. Um, and during my 15-year career, I have trained multinationals and also tax authorities. 
So now when I teach them about crypto with my business partner, um, we have 10 courses in which we go through everything. Uh, we start actually with classification, with, um, and this is an important issue because 10 years ago, I was again here about BIPs too, because um, I had a structure with the transparent entity with which um, classifications issues were coming not only from tax law, but also corporate law. So now when we do trainings, we give every month a free training about money laundering, for example, with the Dutch prosecution office, with um, about mixers and then, uh, you know, other topics. I noticed that the problem with education is both sides. Both sides have issues, but they have different interests. Um, and what's important is that you already have a good knowledge from the OECD report, page 10 to 12, when you talk about commercial classification, you know, payment token, utility token, security token, and hybrid token, which is stable coins. But then when, when it comes about tax, what I'm really super worried about is last week I was talking with the European Association of Tax Lawyers, CFE, and I was worried that all of the wonderful wor uh, work that was done by BIPs is now going to waste because uh, cryptocurrency is distorting the, the beautiful work that was done. So my question to OECD is, if you amend uh, our, um, Action 15, the multi multilateral instrument, and you have classification there and other things that we worry about today, Will this fix the problem or it's a slow thing because at the moment only 50 countries signed it? Thank you. Oh, that's a tough question. So I think that question you should write to us and we should talk bilaterally because we actually have a tax department that is doing a consultation. And I think it's a, maybe it was you, but someone had written us a very similar question that we'll get to after this conference is over. But that's going to require us to, to have a conversation with you. Very, very pertinent and timely question. Uh, I've I've really ignored this side. Of okay, all right, thanks. Um, I'll try to keep it brief because I know time is marching on. But um, I'll be Demirkova with FTI in Brussels. I'm really interested to hear both the private side and the and the public side on if yes or no do you see room for uh, coexistence of stable coins coming from banks or coming from private sector providers and where that room is. If, and if you don't, why not? Thank you. Where it would exist. Okay, okay, sure, sure. No, that makes sense. Very good. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, Tommaso Stazzi, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Blockchain for Europe, so another Brussels-based uh, trade association representing the sector at EU level. And uh, very interesting discussion, so really timely and really appreciated, and also really appreciated the discussion on regulatory frameworks especially for what is happening right now in Brussels. Uh, as we mentioned it a couple of times, the Mika regulation. So I didn't want to go too much into details, but I really would like to hear uh, the panelists' views on the latest developments, especially regarding the limits that the Mika regulation will impose on uh, foreign currency denominated stable coins. So especially because we have two of the biggest examples of USD denominated stable coins, and maybe for those who are not aware, uh, the Mika tax, as it's currently written, would actually impose limits on the issuance of stable coins used as means of exchange in the European Union. And there is clearly probably a, a will to defend the monetary sovereignty of the European Union, the role of the euro, the future role of the digital euro, and potentially also uh, of a euro stable coin, which, however, is not to be seen out there yet, or at least not in the same uh, with the same um, you know, volumes that we have with the USD denominated stable coin. So I wanted to hear the panelists if, I, if you have any views on this, on these discussions, especially because we are potentially uh, facing a situation in which cryptocurrency markets would not be able to function as they currently function, where 75% of the trades are done through USD denominated stable coins. Thanks a lot. Very good. So I, I just had a thought when we were talking about the need to categorize uh, different kinds of cryptocurrencies, and it led me to think about whether we ought to also, also think about risk peering uh, CBDCs. After all, central banks are traditionally meant to be independent from governments, and 
Uh, this has largely worked, I would say, because of the kind of bearer instrument-like qualities that cash has. It limits a lot of risks that exist. Yet, yet we have seen recently, even in very developed countries, uh, governments use the financial system to deal with what I would call uh, potentially mo uh, politically motivated uh, situations where regulators and uh, the government were able to uh, offboard and demarket many uh, non-criminal persons for having donated to a cause that they believed in at a time when it was not illegal to do so. And so w w the question I want to ask is, does making the technology of CBDC available to all nations, including potentially authoritarian nations, create risks where it, it will increase the ability to, to have politically motivated attacks on the public whenever there is dissension, for example. Thank you. Yes, I think there are going to be some strong answers, strong, strong answers to that. That's a very, very good question. Any, any other questions or points of view, even from the back? If you, yes. Well, Wonderful. Thank, thank you for, for saying that. That's excellent. I think, let me just see, everyone is, is, is happy. Everyone has been heard on this side, yes, more or less? Okay. So I think you know that we're not going to be able to answer all of those questions. <laughs> and, um, and also, transportation is not as, as efficient as CBDCs, even pilots. And some people <laughs> have trains to catch during a strike that's occurring in Paris. So what I would like to do, if you can be patient, is literally to give each of you only who wants to, some of you may not want to, but each of you who wants to, to give a minute, not to go in depth, but to answer maybe one or two questions at most with your, with your high level view. And, and I'm gonna give, given the train situation, uh, Masaki first and then Leonardo, and then I'll start on Tom's side since he, he, he took the brunt of it during the day and come back this way, if that's okay with everyone. Yes, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna answer for two questions. The first question is on the uh, crime nature uh, of CBDC. And uh, I'm a lawyer, and from a lawyer's perspective, the term crime and liability are not the same. And uh, banknotes uh, used to be crimes, uh, of the direct crimes of the central bank. You can bring your banknotes to the uh, counter of the central bank, and in exchange for banknotes, uh, central bank used to give gold. But it's not the case now. So uh, now banknotes are not crime just direct liability uh, of the central bank. And uh, for CBDC, I think this uh, characteristics will be unchanged. So we define uh, CBDC as direct liability of the central bank for uh, end users. And uh, on the question on key management, uh, I think uh, this aspect is definitely uh, important for the development of uh, CBDC. And uh, it is quite likely that uh, the end point, uh, touch point uh, for end user to CBDC will depend on smartphone devices. And therefore, the security features uh, of smartphone devices is a, a very uh, interesting topic uh, for us. And uh, we have an in house research institute, uh, which is the Institute of uh, Monetary and Economic Studies. And we have some stock takings on the uh, TEE's uh, trusted uh, uh, encrypted uh, environment in the smartphone devices. And uh, so far on the CBDC uh, experimentation, uh, we have focused on the ledger technologies, uh, which uh, will record the core transactions of CBDC. But if we uh, broaden our works, uh, definitely the uh, 
security of endotope point devices, including uh, wallet uh, devices, will be within our scope. Thank you. Thank you, Misaki. So, Leonardo, over to you, and I'm really going to stick to one minute, so I'll put my pen up when we hit one minute. For your question about uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the how to position in this uh, trade-off between efficiency and privacy, so because I have to elaborate a little bit more, because otherwise uh, I, uh, I, I seem naive. Uh, so um, when, I, when I was looking, uh, when I was describing this uh, trade-off, I was uh, thinking, uh, you know, uh, at the extreme uh, a situation in which you have uh, uh, only efficiency and uh, all the data are available to financial intermediaries and so on, uh, and at the other extreme, uh, basically, uh, you, don't win, you don't want to give the data. No, basically, mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, I, I, I just want privacy, okay? So in the middle, there are a number of solutions. As for central bank digital currency, I'm perfectly with you. There are uh, uh, minimal rules uh, to be followed, and uh, there is a CP CPMI IOSCO principle to be followed in terms of payment and so on that we have not to preclude. But uh, then, of course, in terms of... Uh, the flexibility about uh, how to give uh, the user control over the data. You can be, you know, on one, more on one side or more on the other side, hopefully without touching the extreme, because otherwise uh, our uh, rights are in a way uh, touched and uh, we don't want this. So I hope that I've been more uh, uh, precise uh, and uh, yeah. not to give the impression that I don't want uh, privacy at all. Thank you. And this is the beginning of conversation, so we can all be in touch. <laughs> Tom, to you. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll pick up that one first. Privacy and efficiency are not always a trade-off. Um, you can move the curve rather than just travel along it. Um, you can design systems in a way that preserve privacy as well as preserving liquidity and security. You can do a lot by having better coordination and dialogue between the financial supervisors and the data protection and privacy supervisors. We've been working to build some of that dialogue recently, and there are privacy-enhancing technologies that you can use to, again, reduce the degree to which you have to compromise. So all of that's something we need to cover in the future. Um, on parliaments, um, it's an obstacle. It adds time, but it doesn't mean things are impossible. Um, currently, 60 countries have legislated. 30 more are in the process of legislation. That only leaves another 110. Um, and the latecomers might find themselves frozen out of this market once we hit a critical mass and everybody is doing things um, in a legitimate way. Scott. So as a professor, I never go over time because my students have never let it, so I'm feeling really uncertain right now. Uh, so I'll just say two quick things. One, on uh, characterization of tokens. This is a really big deal. Can't talk about it now, but just say there should be asset level disclosures and not issuer disclosures. We need to change our paradigm about that. The other thing is, uh, I'm an empiricist, not a theoretician. I think stable coins and CBT CBTs can certainly coexist. They should both be permitted, and we should see what happens. We'll find out. Absolutely. At all, Adeline? Thank you. Um, so just regarding uh, CBDC and CBDC or banknotes, um, at least uh, central bank money, uh, is a liability of uh, central banks. Um, I'm not sure it would be a CBDC, uh, I'm not sure CBDC, I don't know if CBDC would be a claim or not, um, but it's maybe just a question of vocabulary because um, banknotes, at least in France, uh, you, you have a property right but you don't have a claim on the central bank. You, you cannot come with your bank notes to, 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 to see the central bank of France. It's not, so you have a property right. Um, so we, it would depend on the design, of course, of, uh, of a CBDC, and uh, we do not have the, the response yet. Um, regarding your question, uh, regarding the demand for retail CBDC, um, Actually, the rationale in Europe, at least within the euro system, um, we have two objectives. Uh, the first one is to preserve the uh, monetary sovereignty. So maybe it's not tangible, I don't know if it's uh, for uh, people or citizens at least, but our objective is to preserve this uh, public-private partnership we have uh, for uh, money 
uh, in particular uh, for bug nuts. Um, we, we, we want to preserve these uh, two levels, these two stages. The first one is central bank money, and the second one is commercial bank money, um, with banks, uh, commercial banks, uh, which are, um, uh, which contribute actually actively to the uh, financing of the economy. So this is our main objective. And uh, as you may have noticed, we, uh, we, we use less and less banknotes. And we also want to preserve the link between central banks, the, the balance sheet of central banks and citizens. And it's, uh, for us, it's part of this um, uh, monetary system. Uh, we want to preserve, to preserve actually at the end, the trust in money. Um, and, uh, but yes, it's not really tangible for citizens, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. fact. Uh, the second objective is to reinforce uh, the um, strategic autonomy in Europe. Um, and uh, in particular, a digital euro could um, be used, or uh, at least uh, private actors could uh, leverage on a digital euro to uh, propose new payment solutions, uh, which are uh, European payment solutions. Uh, and you may know this uh, uh, private initiative, EPI, uh, the European Payment Initiatives. Um, and uh, the objective here is to build on the, to, on the digital level um, real payment solution for Europe. Thank you, Evelyn. Simon? Th thanks, Rob. Uh, just a, a quick one to mention to address your point on uh, stable coins, like that terminology is a relic of crypto past, right? And so it's it's all it's relative to the volatility of the asset class, which is obviously huge. So I wouldn't be too attached to that as a, as a sure. That's exactly what I think. Crypto punks, tech savvies, uh, crypto believers do not care if Tether is audited or not, of, or whether it is uh, stable coin or not, or whether it will go to 140 or 60 cents. They don't care. Luna fell. They don't care, cared about that. But policymakers, they use that definition to make sure that uh, companies like Tether will have to register at the European authority. Uh, they will have to meet many requirements. So they will have many problems because of the term. It's a, it's a, it's a matter of definition. That's exactly what, what my point was. Yeah, I would say it's not that they don't care. The, at least the responsible ones care, right? Uh, Luna is just reckless financial engineering, uh, but you know the competent operators certainly care. But I'm just saying the terminology itself, right? It could be a better named. Um, as far as uh, issues that are more closely pertaining to like uh, to my work or the work at Bit, um, again, privacy. You, you can say like. Even what Jerome Powell says about a digital U.S. dollar, there's there's contradiction, or at least there's difficulty in uh, fulfilling the the requirements of a digital U.S. dollar from uh, um, Chairman Powell's perspective, and that is, he said, it needs to be identity verified but privacy protecting. Um, and so there's you know there's a number of technical solutions that could arrive at that outcome, debate like, but it's debatable about how it, how you know. The, the, the extent to which privacy will be preserved and who will be responsible for that and, and what technology is used. So um, my, to, like to address that, I would just say you need more uh, technically explicit standards and technically explicit sort of um, uh, ways of architecting these solutions and that's what we're focused on. It's like, because in the wrong hands, obviously the outcomes could be, uh, uh, could be undesirable and I'll sort of come to my previous point, and that was I think the financial systems of the future, they will be scrutinized based on how much you have to trust what another person or institution is saying about it and how much you can technically prove. Uh, because again, th that's sort of what gives Bitcoin a large amount of its value proposition. Yeah, so sure. I, I will start um, replying to the concept of stability, right? So I think that there is a little bit of confusion in your point on the fact that um, stability we have as a stablecoin issuer to offer it at the primary market, right? So we are the stablecoin issuer and in fact, Tether never refused a redemption at $1, right? That is the key thing. So if on some exchanges where the liquidity is low, the price fluctuated, 
cannot be the problem of Tether, right? So that is a self-resolving um, problem because market makers will step in and will profit from these fluctuations. Tether did, in my opinion, something that not even, or at least really few banks in the world could do, right? Uh, just after the Terra Luna crash, right, I've been the first person really vocal about Terra Luna. Um, even in April, well, I was here in, in Paris, right? There was the blockchain week, and I was asked what I was thinking about Terra Luna. And I was extremely critic, saying that it was really difficult to, for them to maintain the peg being an algorithm stable coin. And so, in fact, the term stablecoin for them was not correct. That's why I kept saying we need categorization. With Tether, so after the Terra Luna crash, so it was public information, um, short sellers started to put pressure on the market to try to create an issue, a systemic issue to Tether. So the only job of stablecoin is to issue when there is demand, when cash enters the bank, and also redeem when people won't get out, right? So Tether was able to process $7 billion in two days. That was around 10% of our assets. And around uh, $20 billion in uh, around one month, that was 25% of our assets. Now the question is, which bank in the world is able to fulfill that type of demand? Right. So we had a, an example in 2008, uh, a, a bank in Washington called Washington Mutual couldn't fulfill a 10% redemption in 10 days and then went bankrupt. Right. So I think that, yes, people want uh, information from stable coins, and we are at the forefront of providing that information. Um, a report from Fitch says that Tether is actually um, the stable coin among the two, sta two, two stable coins providing more information in the sector. Our information on a quarterly basis goes to the New York Attorney General. So we have been taking enormous steps to provide comfort to the public. And so, of course, we can only control the when it comes to the stability, the primary market. So it means that Tether has always to redeem Tether USDT for one dollar or Euro Tether for for one for one Euro, right? So, <clears throat> so I hope that answers uh, your question. When it comes to collaboration between or coexistence between privately and, and uh, stable coins and and CBDCs, I think that there is an enormous possibility. Right? I really doubt that uh, CBDCs will issue on Ethereum, will issue on Solana, on all these blockchains, right? So. And this blockchain have a sense to exist. There is you no, know, there is a, a lot of to experiment there. So, I think that the role of privately issued stablecoins is to provide rails for that type of uh, uh, new products, and while CBDCs have to uh, take care of all the financial industry and interbanking settlement. Thank you, Paolo. So I will have the last word. Um, we we sought, to, uh, and I'll be very quick. We sought to um, achieve a really enlightened discussion among public and private sector with the panelists, with all of you. I think we, we made a lot of strides there looking at activities, risks, and policy. We talked about international financial architecture and whether we need to make additional strides to try and address some of these policy challenges. I think we have a lot of answers, but also many questions. But getting to the right questions, important questions, are really uh, uh, vital for us, and, and we made strides there. And. Uh, we didn't answer all of the questions, so what we're going to do is a, a summary, a write-up of this, and I believe we have all of your contacts for those of you who've signed up, so at the very least, we can pass that around to you in the coming weeks. And lastly, I just want to thank the, the, the panelists and all of you who have taken two and a half hours, I failed on discipline, two and a half hours to be here with us and, and to give us your thoughts and, and, and such. So thank you all for your participation. Very much appreciated.